I will call to order the Common Council meeting on December 14th at 7.30. Please rise while the Honor Guard presents the colors. Be seated. Roll call, please, Tracy. Alder Allen. Present. Alder Radafrata. Here. Alder Gerhardt. Here. Alder Herbs. Here. Alder Maldonado will be late. Mayor Richardson. Here. Alder Strassman. I believe she'll be late to Alder Udell. Present. Alder Wheeler. Here. You have a quorum, Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first up tonight is the mayoral proclamation. Uh, the many people are here today to help us celebrate a couple of very big milestones. This year is the 50th anniversary of both our police department and fire department here in Fitchburg. And so we wanted to definitely recognize that. And there are some cupcakes and refreshments afterwards to right down the hall. So you're all welcome to those as well. I believe if people want to come up and with me while I read this, I'll do some photos quick. I'd appreciate it. So if, and we got some PFC members, past and present. We've got... Uh, the mayor, so anyone else is welcome to join us up here. Thank you, Chiefs. All right, so like I mentioned, recognizing 2021 is the City of Fitchburg Police and Fire Department 50th anniversary year. In 2021, members of our Police and Fire Department celebrate 50 years of serving the citizens of Fitchburg by safeguarding life and property and by protecting them against violence or disorder. And whereas, uh, 50 years ago, in 1971, the population of the town was approximately 4,000 people. And whereas, today the city of Fitchburg population is 31,869, and the city encompasses 35 square miles. And whereas, in 1971, Tom Askey was hired as the first chief to organize a full-time police department. And whereas, in 1971, the town board of Fitchburg passed an ordinance to form its own fire department, and appointed Herman Fund as the first chief. And whereas, 
1972, Chief Bund was commanding a fire department with five pieces of equipment and a staff of all volunteers, consisting of an assistant chief, five captains, five lieutenants, and 26 firefighters. And whereas in 1976, Chief Askey was commanding a police department with a detective, a sergeant, six patrolmen, and an animal control officer. And whereas only four people have served as chief in the 50 year history of the police department, Terry Askey, Tom Blatter, Chad Brecklin, and Alfonso Morales. And whereas, under the guidance of those police chiefs, the Fitchburg Police Department evolved from a rural policing unit to a police force today of 52 sworn personnel and 12 full-time non-sworn personnel. And whereas, seven people have served as chief in the 50-year history of the fire department, Herman Fund, Matthew White, Larry Huber, Simon Hertzler, David Fulmer, Randall Pickering, Chad Grossen, and Joe Pulvermacher. And whereas, under the guidance of those fire chiefs, the Fitchburg Fire Department evolved from a rural, all-volunteer fire department to a force of a full-time chief, a full-time deputy chief, 12 full-time officers and firefighters, six fire science interns, 41 paid on-call, paid on-premise officers and firefighters, and 12 support staff members. And whereas the Fitchburg Police Department now handles 22,000 calls for service per year, and whereas the Fitchburg Fire Department now handles 2,100 calls for service per year. And now, therefore, I, Aaron Richardson, Mayor of the City of Fitchburg, do hereby proclaim 2021 as the City of Fitchburg Police and Fire Department 50th anniversary year in the City of Fitchburg, and urge all citizens to join with me in congratulating and celebrating with the police and fire departments as they remember their past and look forward to the successes of the future. Proclaim this 14th day of December, 2021. I know I mentioned this at the award ceremony for the fire department that my uncle Jerry was one of the people who was part of the initial fire department actually here. And he worked with many of the people that I mentioned here today. I believe he probably also kept the police department busy when he was here as well when they first started. But you know, something where my dad, I was talking to my dad and he was mentioning some other people who were involved uh, way back then and people who I've known my whole life. And we're really fortunate to have such a great police and fire department here in the city of Fitchburg. I'll let both chiefs here say a few words as well, but thank you all for being here. It's really a, a historic achievement, and I think it's great that we were able to celebrate the first 50 years and looking forward to many, many more great ones from here. Thank you. I'll, I'll keep it short. Just basically, one of the things that um, I'm, uh, I'm probably the, uh, the luckiest to, to be able to talk to is the fact that I actually met a Herman Fund the, uh, the initial fire chief for the uh, city of Fitchburg. His vision was remarkable as far as what this department was intended to be and is, uh, is starting to, to claim through, through the, uh, the course of its history. So um, I am very much uh, in, a, in, a, in a position of honor uh, to be able to speak on behalf of the, the men and women of the Fitchburg Fire Department and recognize the, the good work that's happened over the past 50 years. And uh, thankfully to the, uh, to the vision of Herman Fund, we are able to do what we do today. Thank you, Mayor. This is actually quite an honor and it's a part of making history. Um, we will, or someone, maybe the next generation or two generations down the line, uh, but it's gonna be reflected and you usually go to the 25, 50, 75, 100 year markers. This is very important. You may be on a photo. You may be part of a saying that will be used for hundreds of years. And some of those police sayings is, let's go meet back at the barn. Barn, where did the barn start from? That's back when we were operating on horses and buggies, carriages. Well, there'll be, there'll be slang that we use now, police language, that we're going to invent and keep for hundreds of years. So think about that as you operate out there, some of the things I'm part of making history. Very important, 
we are we all here are part of that history so something to look forward to and be a part of thank you very much thank you i know we have a, a couple of former mayors here as well Jeannie, is there anything that you would like to share at all no all right uh francis i know that we've got you online is there anything that you'd like to share with us no all right all right excellent then congratulations uh, is all i want to say Congratulations. Thank you. Then, did you get all the pictures you need, Scott, yet? All right, hold on. And like I mentioned, there are some cupcakes down the hall in the Genie Ceiling Room. You're welcome to go down there and visit and eat those. And for council members, there are some in the break room. So if you would like to uh, get one later, if they're all gone, there are a few in there. So you will have that. All right. Uh, moving along, we do have a few mayoral appointments. First one up is, I'm going to say your last name wrong probably, but Katie Trudnick for the Healthy Neighborhood Advisory Committee, and she's online with us. Katie, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in being on this? Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Um, my name is Katie Trudinick. I've been a resident of Fitchburg since 2019, and I'm currently a student at UW-Madison uh, studying veterinary medicine and public health. And I'm at school right now, so I apologize if there's some background noise. Um, but I've, over the last few years, um, have been wanting to get more involved in the community. And I reached out to Alders Maldonado and Gerhardt, um, I think it's almost two years ago now, in trying to get more involved in Common Council and saw this as an opportunity to do so um, in another way. Um, and I have a passion for health equity. That's why I wanted to do a public health in addition to a degree in vet med and currently serve as a co-coordinator for environmental justice um, in an organization called Wisconsin Advocates for Public Health. Um, so I really view health equity in that lens and um, also have a a student board member position at the Wisconsin Veterinary Medical Foundation, uh, where we oversee grants that we give out to folks um, that are in three of our mission categories, which is pet education and disaster relief and um, funds for veterans. So I'm interested in being more involved in our community and, and working on that in an equitable way and yeah. All right, thank you. Is there any questions for Katie at all? 
don't see any. So is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Jay. Second. Seconded by Gabriella. All in favor of approving, Katie, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right, you are approved, Katie. Thank you very much. All Am right. I good to go? You can leave, yes, yep. Okay. Have <laughs> no, you have to stay for this whole darn meeting. I would leave if I were you. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, next up is uh, Ryan Estrella, also for the Healthy Neighborhoods Advisory Committee. Now, he actually has served on H&I for a while, but because it's now an official permanent committee, we have to like officially appoint him to the um, official committee, the permanent committee. But I didn't ask him to come in because he's been on the committee for a while. It's more of a reappointment almost, more than a new appointment. So if there's a motion for this one. We can so moved. Move by Jay, seconded by Julia. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right, then we have one more appointment. Axel Candelaria Rivera, if you would like to come up. And this is for the Zoning Board of Appeals. If you'd like to just tell us a bit about yourself and why you're interested in being the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yeah, the one right in front of you. Is, that, that's that. Yeah. Is it on? Yep. It is. Can you hear me okay? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for having me here. And the question is, why am I interested? Um, well, I, like I mentioned in my application, I have ha I've had uh, well I have a long history of community service since uh, since high school um, and in college as well, but as I've made progress in my career, kind of made it difficult for me to engage in uh, community service, and all of the time that I have free, I spend doing pro bono work, but sometimes it just takes too long, and uh, I want to have uh, an ability to reach out to more people than just the occasional pro bono case that you take. And I saw this opportunity and I thought that it, it, it matches my experience and my abilities extremely well. And I thought, you know, this is an opportunity for me to engage in the community. The past 10 years, um, I was working for the state government, so I couldn't really be out there as much, especially when some of my responsibi responsibilities included representing the state in manufacturing property tax disputes. And, um, but now I'm not, I'm in the private sector, and um, I thought this is a good opportunity. All right, any questions there, Dave? Uh, just comment, you know, Axel is my, my neighbor, uh, I, I'd say, He's as qualified as any, you know, I'd say he's overqualified for this. He, so, but uh, he's, a good, he's a good neighbor and I, I would say, in addition to being a, a skilled with, you know, with his mind, uh, he is skilled with his hands. I see him working on his car, doing landscaping. He's an he's a all, around, all around talented guy and we're, we're lucky to have him uh, wanting to serve on this committee. I do plumbing and electrical work too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I want to do a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Randy. Second. Seconded by Jay. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. Excellent. You're approved. All right. Thank you, Axel. Thank you. All right. Moving on to consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Second. A <laughs> so moved. <laughs> no, a motion to approve first. <laughs> so moved. Second. Seconded by Jim. I know you're new to this, Jay. <laughs> Is there anything? Get that, out of here, man. <laughs> is there anything that anyone wants to pull out separately on this one? All right, seeing none. All in favor of approving, say aye. Aye. And opposed, nay. All right, consent agenda is approved. Before we do an administrator's report, I think there's a potential agenda change that you'd like to have. I don't know if someone, you talked to someone about making a motion. I did not, but uh, I'm actually. <laughs> So I think it's uh, finance number 2B. Okay, so I move to um, to move uh, up the, the agenda resolution um, 2B, resolution R-226-21. Second. 
submitted by Jay and after administrator support, maybe is that a good spot for it? All right. Oh, and, okay. and so, and part of that is because we have Greg and Frank online and from Ellers and Mike is here and yeah, so we might let them get out of here. All right, uh, all in favor of amending the agenda to move up uh, 2B, say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, uh, first we'll do administrator's report though. Good evening everyone. Uh, just a few items today. Uh, I wanted to update the council. I sent an email on this, uh, I think uh, earlier this week or late last week. My days tend to run together, sadly. Uh, but we had some uh, comments from citizens in regards to the recent repaving or resurfacing of South Sion Road. I uh, thought it'd be helpful, uh, and uh, other Herps and I uh, had talked about this, uh, sharing this update that I'd shared with the council uh, for the rest of the community to hear. Uh, but ultimately, there were three questions posed to the council in regards to the South Sion Road resurfacing project from Aurora uh, to the south. Uh, first question was, is there was a section of pavement that was left unpaved uh, between Aurora and Lacey. Uh, that section will be repaved as part of another uh, road project uh, next year, uh, as from basically Aurora uh, to the north to East Cheryl. Uh, the other consideration was uh, the addition of bike lanes uh, as part of this project, and uh, this project was uh, planned as a resurfacing project only. Uh, and therefore uh, no bike lanes were added um, due to the, the scope of the project. And then finally, uh, there was a comment uh, or concern expressed about the condition of the, the uh, i.e. the smoothness of the pavement in sections of that particular project. So I wanted to inform the community and the council that we have engaged in some conversations with the vendor uh, about some of the concerns that we've identified. So we'll see what that resolution may bring. Any particular questions about that at all? There, yeah. there was, I, I received an email, I think everyone did, and I, I've actually had a couple of conversations with residents about the quality level of the paving and having driven on it a few times, um, it's wavy. <laughs> um, and I, I had sent an email to Bill, but he was on vacation. I, I don't know if he's had a chance to look into that or not. Um, I don't know if Bill has or not. He's just getting back into the office today, but I do know that some of his staff have already been in conversation with the vendor on that particular contractor on that particular project. Julia? Uh, so I know that it's tax collection time. Um, is it, is um, the office open more hours? Can that, you explain to the public that? Yes, that is an item number two, so I will transition to that. Thank you for the segue. <laughs> Uh, yes, tax bills have gone out uh, last week on Friday. I know many folks have obviously received those because we have had steady presence here in City Hall with folks coming in to pay their tax bills. Uh, in light of the new year, uh, City Hall would typically be closing uh, at noon on December 30th and being closed all day on December 31st. Uh, obviously, for the purposes of tax collection, City Hall will be open normal hours, uh, if you will, 7.30 to noon uh, in, in recognition of the New Year's Eve holiday on December 30th. So tax payments can be made in person December 30th from 7.30 to noon. And then City Hall is going to be open uh, for the purposes of collecting tax payments only on the 31st also from 7.30 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, so we know that folks, uh, some typically like to get those uh, payments made right before the, the new year begins. So uh, kudos to Misty and her team uh, for making some adjustments to their schedules in order to accommodate uh, tax bill collections, uh, particularly on December 31st. And then finally, I just wanna announce uh, the second annual Holiday Lights Tour is taking place this Saturday, the 18th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. There are uh, quite a few houses, I wanna say over 40 have signed up uh, this year throughout the city. So please, if you have some uh, time Saturday evening, uh, cruise the streets of Fitchburg and check out the lights. Uh, I have heard rumors that the mayor will be cruising in a sleigh with Santa that evening. I cannot confirm them though. And that is all I've got. Any further questions for Chad? As long as he doesn't get run over by a reindeer. <laughs> well Thankfully I'm not a grandma. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, just a, in terms of the holiday lights tour, I, I read through the 
the news flash, but so do, do people meet or is it everyone just kind of wanders around on their own or? Yes, as far as I'm aware, there's no scheduled okay. like parade, so to speak, of people. You just, at your leisure, uh, whatever time works for you through those hours is, is the recommended time. Awesome. Um, so yeah, no, no fully organized caravan, if you will. On Friday, I think Friday morning, we will be posting a, a map on our website with all the houses listed. And so you'll know where to go and what number each house is so you can go online and vote. And then you have to vote, uh, by, I believe, by the end of day Saturday if you'd like to vote on who you want to win. And they win a nice prize package from some local businesses. So, yeah. Yeah. And a, a news flash about that tax payment timeline would be, would be nice. Just so it's on the front page of the website, it's easy to find. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Moving along. Uh, next up is now from the Finance Committee, uh, 2B, Resolution R22621. Randy, do you want to do a motion on that one? Yes, motion to approve Resolution R-226-21, approving development agreement between Inventure Capital LLC and the City of Fitchburg for the uh, Oshala Drive mixed use project. Second. Senator by Jay, did finance approve? Finance approved. All right, and I don't know, Chad, do you want to present? Do you want someone else to talk about the project itself? Oh, did it go to CETA? Oh, what did, what did CETA do? We approve it. Oh, great, all right. I can at least give the uh, basic overview of it, although Mike uh, Thorson is here if he wants to talk in more detail, uh, but ultimately, uh, Inventure Capital has uh, proposed a 170 unit uh, mixed use building at the uh, far east end of Ochala. And uh, as part of that particular project, the city has uh, asked the developer to extend Ochala from, uh, complete the extension from Fish Hatchery Road to Index Road. Uh, that was identified in an earlier vision study uh, approximately 20 years ago uh, as a desired trait for the city to improve connectivity in uh, that portion of Fitchburg. Uh, Mike, if there's anything else you wanna add in regards to it, uh, this particular agreement, uh, is not to exceed a million dollars uh, for the costs associated with uh, extending Ochala Drive. Sure. Um, thanks, Chad. Uh, I will be very brief in uh, recognition of your um, time and long schedule tonight. Um, I would simply say uh, thank you again for moving us up the schedule. Um, it, it is uh, not, not intended to um, uh, be any sort of compensation for the developer. This, these funds are simply for reimbursement for the construction costs. If the construction costs come in lower, the city has a TIF amount that would be lower as well. Misty, is there anything you'd like to add or would you like Greg or Frank to speak to the agreement at all? Yeah, so Greg and Frank are here to go through the pro forma analysis, and I'm available for questions if there's any. All right. I think that's probably the thing to do now, so I'm not sure who's going to go first, if it's Greg or Frank, but go ahead. Good evening. I'm going to start, and uh, I'll let Greg follow uh, with respect to the overall tax increment district here. Uh, thanks again for allowing us to move forward on the agenda here as well. Um, as Mike mentioned, this is a 170 market unit, uh, market rate apartment unit, and about uh, 10,005 square feet of commercial. Uh, the developer and venture has com recently completed the uh, Terrace Point project uh, just north on Fitch Hatchery Road. Uh, it's noted that that was opened in June and fully leased by the end of July, which is quite the accomplishment. Um, learning from that, they've tailored the the unit mix on this to mostly one and two bedrooms, although providing some studios and three bedrooms as well. So we've gone through the developers uh, project sources and uses budget, the unit mix, income and expenses, operating cash flows, et cetera, to uh, first of all, verify that the uh, figures are correct, but also to um, solve for the, the question for the but for. So in other words, but for the, um, uh, incentive being provided here, the project would not move forward as contemplated, and there also would be no undue enrichment to the developer. Um, 
uh, I'm going to share my screen here for a second and again, try not to overdo that, but uh, this should pop up in front of you shortly. If you want to note the uh, Misty, is that up on screen? Okay, thanks. So um, just introduction that I just went through here, uh, the but four test that we, uh, we go through. So the projects in tax increment district number 10, which is a rehab district established in 2015 is a 27 year term, which would uh, terminate in 2045. Uh, um, four story building, uh, separate retail space on the west end of the project. Uh, the parking uh, coverage is more than adequate for the number of units here. The rents on this are about six and a half percent higher than the Paris Point project we just referenced, and those are within market ranges. So total cost of 38.5 million. Uh, the incentive that's being asked for is uh, 1 million as explained for the cost of the Ochala Drive improvements only. Um, Groundbreaking on the project is expected in March of 22 and complete by the uh, by the end of June of 23. Um, the metrics on the operations of the project are within market norms that we've we've uh, analyzed before. Um, so very briefly, we just we look at a couple of uh, return metrics and in, in going through this as well, uh, both the cash on cash and the internal rate of return or the IRR. The cash on cash is is essentially the uh, cash flow to the developer uh, annually after debt service divided by their equity investment. The IRR is more of a time value of money, and that incorporates those annual cash flows plus a, um, the sales proceeds at the end of a, in this case, we're looking at a 10 year investment hold per commercial real estate convention. So, um, in those respects, the cash on cash range that we normally see for um, commercial projects is between eight to 12 percent um, once the project's stabilized and running along. Um, in this project, the TIF payments are only go through six years because it's a lower amount of a million dollars versus a larger uh, capital expenditure of the 38 million. So um, the cash on cash does increase finally in year 10 up to that range, but again, it's below that mark for the, uh, the, the most of the investment period. The internal rate of return um, is about 14, almost 15% here. That's kind of midway in the expected range of about 11 to 18% for multifamily projects. When we take out the TIF assistance, the cash on cash here is very low. It's in the four to 5% range. Uh, and again, finally reaching 8%, which is that minimum threshold by year 10. Um, that would indicate that the project would not move forward. It would not attract investment capital uh, based on those numbers, based on those metrics. The IRR reduces to a little less than uh, that to 13.5%. Um, but again, that's, I think, uh, mostly um, caused by the kind of aggressive cap rate of this 5.75%. Um, the capitalization rate is a, is a risk valuation. The lower the risk, the, um, the lower the cap rate, the higher the risk, the higher the cap rate. So uh, 5.75 is, is on, the, on the very lower end of where we're seeing the capitalization rates these days for these kind of projects. So uh, satisfying the but for test, um, you know, we, we show that this project will uh, terminate or the assistance of the project will terminate in 2030. Uh, sorry, I'm going to squeeze 2027. And I'll walk you through the quick uh, charts here as well. So we're starting here at uh, construction, we'll start in um, 2022, as we mentioned, about 17 and a half million of value will be put on the books uh, as partial work in, in progress. The project will complete in 2023, the balance of the valuation there, uh, 14 and a half. That gives us an incremental value of 32 million. So the, the value of the project, uh, less the initial land underlying assessed value of 678, 
uh, produces the $32 million increment. We're gonna take that to the next level here and show these uh, valuations um, occurring from construction year 2022 and 2023. Notice though that the working place in 22 is not valued until 2023 and the payout, first payout on that is not available until 2024. So there's a two year lag uh, to the developer from the time work is put in place until they actually receive part of this incentive here. This is gonna follow over here now to the cash flows for the fifth district for this project only. These are the same numbers that you had in the orange column previously. So we're just bringing that forward and then we are paying down the, the incentive, which is um, a pay-as-you-go, developer-funded, uh, is sometimes referred to. And this MRO is, is the municipal revenue obligation, which the, um, the document that evidences the obligation to the developer from the city. So because, again, the value is, is much higher and the, the incentive is over a million dollars, this is able to be paid off very shortly within uh, six years of, of commencement or uh, you know, overall uh, terminating in 2027. Uh, that includes a 5% interest factor uh, for the developer's carry costs on that. These figures here are the, uh, the city's retainage of that at 50% of the incremental value. The city is taking 50% and covering a portion of their administrative expenses in the tax increment district this is the balance that the developer gets at that point. So the obligations under this MRO or this um, pay-as-you-go structure can be completed by 2027. Uh, that's this on the project side. Greg's gonna jump in now on the impact on the overall tax increment district with other projects and borrowings that are in place. Greg? Thank you. So what you can see here is just the summary of the development assumptions for incremental value that's been generated within the entirety of TID District 10 since its, it, since its creation. And then we've also uh, incorporated the Ocala Drive project that we just discussed and then estimate the incremental value for projects constructed in 2021, uh, which is the remainder of the Park Bank project and the uh, Terrace Point apartment complex. So we're looking at incremental value in a fairly short uh, period of time to see how that impacts the overall performance of the TIP district. Uh, so next is just the incremental uh, tax revenue projection, similar to what uh, Frank summarized for uh, the project specific calculation. This looks at the uh, projected increment over the remainder of the TID 10 maximum life, just based off of that increment value generated to date and then the projected incremental value from uh, the Ocala project and uh, projects constructed in 2021. So in terms of the total cash flow for TID district number 10, uh, we've included that model as well. Um, the primary revenue to the district is tax increment revenue. Uh, the city has also made some capital investment through borrowings, primarily for portions of the Fish Hatchery Road project that were deemed to be eligible to TID district 10. And then there are some existing uh, municipal revenue obligations or developer pay go incentive payments for other projects outstanding. Uh, we've estimated those payments as well. Um, so when we look at the overall cash flow performance for um, TID District number 10, um, taking into account this project, the proposed incentive not to exceed 1.1 million, and then existing debt and existing incentive payments. Uh, you can see that the TID district is projected to close, you know, several years early uh, before its full maximum life. So the general summary of TID 10 is that this project is helping to generate some additional increment uh, that further uh, supports the district's ability to repay the debt service for the TID 10 portion of the Fitch Hatchery Road project, which you know provides some additional comfort uh, to the financial performance of the district. Uh, so that's how this project impacts TID 10. Uh, can so I have that, a, we're we're happy have, to answer any questions. Uh, Jay, you have a quick question? Yeah, I would like to ask one question right there. <laughs> um, so what, um, according to this chart, the projected closeout for the TID is gonna be 2039, 2040. Prior to this project being incorporated into the spreadsheet, what was the expected closure of the TID? Sure, let me uh, look that up and I'll give that, uh, give that to you here in a moment. 
I believe that it was going to close before it essentially paid off. This is I'm, my understanding is this project kind of guarantees that the TID will be successful and that it will actually close before it, it needs to. Yeah, I can answer that too. So uh, exactly what Aaron said. So without this project, based on the current development that's known and the current costs that are known, uh, the TID needed another, I think it was $10 million worth of value in order to cash flow by the life. So um, part of the benefit of this project would be it's make sure that Fish Hatchery Road is paid for and that we can now close it early absent any other activity. Yeah, that's correct. We were showing previously that the district would still close early, but this has moved the closure up uh, a couple of years. Misty, is there anything else before we get to more questions that you would like to add at all? I just, I guess, want to reaffirm that this is money just for the road. Uh, so it is just the, the actual cost for that infrastructure, which is a pretty classic use of TID. Um, and also the benefit of doing it, though, still as this PAYGO funding, um, just to reiterate, so that really pushes that risk onto the developer. So we could, in theory, put the road in ourselves, borrow for it, but then if the project didn't happen, the TID and the city would still be on the hook for it. By doing the PAYGO method, if the project doesn't go through, they don't get reimbursed for that road, and that's the developer's risk and encourages them to do this project. Mike Z, anything you want to add before we get to questions or comments from the council? I just want to reaffirm <clears throat> the positives with this project and everything here. You might remember when we created tax increment district number 10 with the amendment. That was a risk that we took, and we hope that if we reconstructed Fish Hatchery Road, that if we build it, the private sector would reinvest in the corridor as well. Uh, we've got some great projects already. Uh, this adds to it and makes the TID district cash flow. So it uh, helps us all to know that we have that assurance that the district will be successful. And I think that's a really good thing for our community. It's a win-win all the way around for the public sector and the private sector and a, a really good use of TIF for it. So thanks everybody for your support. I think uh, this is huge for the community. All right, unless you have anything else, Chad, I can go to questions or comments. Julia. Yes. Um, uh, Greg, this is for you. This is Alder Julia Riata Farata. I want to ask a question because um, in 2019, we extended this um, tax incremental district. Um, my question to you, we are in a, you know, it's a, a still relatively new uh, phase. Um, we are getting all these uh, increments already. So if we bring more uh, project to this corridor, um, so the chances to close this district sooner is, 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 is that the correct assumption? That's a correct assumption. So I think it's kind of weighing if you have additional projects that generate additional increment value, you know, the other factor to take into consideration if there's going to be any expenditure, whether that be a development incentive or any other public investment to bring that development to fruition. Um, but, you know, assuming you're going to, as the city typically does, make sure that you hold back some increment to support, you know, project costs and the general support of the district overall. Yes, if you see additional development within the district, that's just going to accelerate the ability to pay off the project costs faster. Jim. Yeah, what I like about this project that it was part of a plan from 2003 and that in order to get this done is a cheap way, a, a very efficient way to get it done without much stress on the taxpayer. So I like the planning that goes on and being able to complete this plan I think is um, uh, out, outstanding. Excellent. Julia. Uh, yeah, so I want to um, uh, make a comment about this project. I, you know, I really like the project that, Mike, you're bringing to, and you're continuing investing in, in, in our community. I thank you. Um, I was reluctant at the beginning about, because I didn't understand why uh, they needed the, the mil uh, $1 million uh, in TIF. But I, uh, being because this is, but there is no land division, you don't need to put the road. This is a city asking you to put the road, so it's our request. Um, you know, um, I understand why we need to provide you with tax incremental uh, financing. So I am fine with that. My question is, we are bringing a lot of uh, fair market value apartment on the east side of Fish Hatchery Road. I would like to see in the future to have a balance in the west of Fish Hatchery Road, 
because um, in that area we have most of uh, the multifamily are low income. And I think we need to have a balance of um, um, different, uh, um, the diversity of, of, of mixed income, I will call, um, in both sides. So that one I, I am, you know, I, I really, I like your project. We are bringing the density. I am not against density. I think uh, the North Fish Hatchery Road parcel are, you know, they are no big parcel where we can develop neighborhood. We don't have too many options of housing that we have to develop there. It's all a multifamily or maybe townhouses. But, um, you know, so I, I, I understand now why you're requesting the, the TIF, so, um, and I fully support this project. Great. Thank you. Of what your commercial, you know, you're off the beaten, you're off the beaten track, you know, being off of fish hatchery, what would be viable there? I'm, I'm just curious. You know, even. We, <laughs> the, the, the commercial parts of these projects are never what drive um, the, the pro formas. Uh, we actually like the fact, a, and w without being asked to kind of include a commercial component um, by, by, by city staff or officials, we, we like the fact that we can put a nice um, commercial component uh, that does front uh, off fish hatchery, and it is rather visible actually, just behind um, the, the you know, if you look at a Google map, it looks like there's a ton of trees and all that, but those trees are gone. So it, it is a reasonably visible section that is just off, of, and, and we don't mind being just off of fish hatch because that gives us a better ability to try to park um, uh, an establishment, particularly if it was a hospitality type of establishment. Uh, we could see that being um, partially a restaurant, um, some other services. Uh, we have um, at, at the Terrace Point, um, Southern Commercial, where we're moving our offices. We're also bringing in a, um, we're discussing a wellness center uh, with, with a potential tenant and also a, an insurance agency. Um, we could see some sort of use, um, any of those types, uh, and we, we don't mind the location. In fact, we think it's superior if it were hospitality because the parking would be much simpler to do back there. Makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, early on in the presentation, very early on, uh, a 6.6% increase over the terrorist point, if I'm not mistaken, was presented from the Ellers presentation. So I'm not sure who can answer the question, but I'm, I'm curious about why the 6.6% increase. I mean, terrorist point was a wonderful project and a gorgeous property. Is, is the 6.6% 6 .6 increase, is, is, if I'm clear in my mind, is it because of supply? Is, are the the apartments themselves are even upscale from Terrace Point, or just out of curiosity, more than anything uh, else. That I actually disagree with that number. I don't. I don't know if that number is correct. I'm not sure how how Ehlers has calculated that. So I'm just pulling out my calculator and I'll mm. work it up for you. Uh, While you're doing that, if I can maybe go to Julia. I know you have another comment. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah, a Mike, comment. it was based on the uh, oh. projections from the Terrace Point going in versus the projections on this project going in, the rough calculations. So it was based off the Terrace Point, Terrace Point projections. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, I understand. So we did actually achieve um, slightly higher rents at Terrace Point than those pro formas, Frank. Um, uh, I'm calculating, we're, we're basing this as about a 3.1% off of the initial rents that we did at Terrace Point. And that simply accounts for the fact that, look, this is gonna be built two years after the sure. open yeah. and, and rents are gonna go up by then. Yeah. Um, unless something unforeseeable happens, which mm -hmm. which we don't expect. No, that's why I'm basing yeah. questions. I mean, there's so many factors, I'm just curious. So yeah, we're, we're doing our pro forma. Uh, just mm -hmm. we typically will take a 3% off of what our existing portfolio in a similar structure when we're doing the next build. Very and that's good. what we did here. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Julia, you know your comment? So this is a comment from Mike. Uh, you know, um, I work with a lot of a small and medium-sized business for my other job, and one of the comments that some uh, 
clients ask me, if they say, why you don't move to Fitchport? And they say, because um, some of them, they are a small business that they are services, you know, like, but they say there are not too many rental spaces that they are small, you know, they are all big ones, you know what I mean? Or they are like um, more smaller places for, you know, for some s services, you know, you mentioned like uh, could be an uh, insurance agency, you know, that they don't need too much um, space or, mm. or, um, or hair uh, salon, you know? So all of those typical, you know, um, professional services. Um, so, um, so I don't know if, uh, have you considered, you know, what is going to be the size of those uh, mixed commercial space that you're going to, you know, build in this? So, so we have, yes, and okay. uh, thank you for that question. Um, we typically, because we don't, fully have a great understanding of what, what is going to possibly be in. We try to create the space in a sort of a gray box fashion that's okay. ultimately very flexible depending upon the types of tenants. So the 5,000 square feet at the southern part of, of Terrace Point, for example, was just a big open space. We had a ton tenant come in, I need 1,300. Adventure came in, says we're going to take 2,500. So now we're left with a, a third space, which is you know roughly 16, 1,700. Um, so that's what happens, and then we carve the space up to fill the the needs of the tenants. It's a little bit different with the north uh, commercial at at Terrace Point. It's a giant yeah. 5,000 square foot where our hope ultimately is to attract a hot, uh, a restaurant or a bar and grill of some sort um, because of the the attractiveness of that location, the high visibility and the high traffic. Uh, we could see something similar where part of that space at, at the new Ashawa project would also be a hospitality. I mean, our, our, you made the comment before about the, the, the affordability and the both sides. I will, I will say this, based upon the, the HUD um, criteria for affordability at the 80% income level, which is generally considered workforce housing. 80% um, of the units at Terrace Point meet that criteria with it being a market rate building. Um, slightly less percentage at the new O'Shawa project, but I would expect by the time the new numbers come out in 2023 when that opens, that uh, roughly 80% of those units will also be affordable at the 80% level. Um, Simply by virtue of we try to create a, a, a building with a with a rent structure that will f fill up quickly and be affordable for the area that it's in. Um, in addition, and and you know, give you a, a tidbit, we have we have big plans for other parts of the the Fish Hatchery Road. We we were very excited about the whole reconstruction effort. Um, we we see a lot of opportunity for urban infill, um, ownership components too. Um, that we were discussing. Uh, one of the reasons why, you know, we really do, you know, despite the fact that this project d did not need the Oshawa Drive extension, there are some projects and developable areas behind there that will really benefit from that Oshawa Drive extension coming through. Um, and, and we have plans for uh, later on the agenda, there's a, a, a minor amendment to the comprehensive plan that's gonna be considered that we are proposing. Um, for some ownership units back there, and then some plans on, on the west side of Fish Hatchery as well for some more multifamily with perhaps some affordability components. So we, we, we're getting there. And just to clarify, we're not going to be discussing the amendment to the comp plan tonight. We referred it out to oh, you the it plan okay. to talk about it next week. So I was going to ask, so I don't need to no. stay. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome to stay. <laughs> we will not turn, you know, kick you out. But all right, there's cupcakes up the hall. All right, I uh, don't see anyone else, so we can go ahead and vote. All in favor of approving this? Say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, that is approved. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you. Good night. All right. Back to the regular agenda. Nothing on plan commission tonight, unless there's anything that you want to add, Randy, right now? No, I have nothing to add. All right, uh, Public Works, Dave.
approval of resolution, resolution R16121, approving reimbursement in the sub, uh, in the sub interceptor and wet well installation costs for Terra Vesta. Is there a second? Second. Signed by Julia, the public works approved. Public works approved. The finance approved. Finance approved. All right. What's this one about, Dave? So there's two two components uh, uh, in this. When we, uh, I think a number of you, most of you are aware that this is a this is a subdivision that ended up having to have a we had to have a grinder and a gravity uh, pump to get up to uh, a gravity feed into the in the um, mass and met interceptor system. So. Um, the developer, he was required to pay a certain amount of cost. We also upsized some additional pipes in, the, um, in there. And so we are paying for two things or we're being, the developer paid for these, they're asking us to reimburse them for as the upsizing of these pipes and the installation of a wet well. I don't know if you recall when uh, uh, Director Madison Met was in here and he was talking about the wet wells and that they have to go in and, and uh, uh, kind of nasty repair. We, it's kind of a, the wet well, a place to kind of accumulate the sewage or whatever. And uh, I, I don't think we have that taken into account <laughs> for cleaning that, but that's not for this point. But um, they are asking for the reimbursement of 181,000. Um, let's see where I had it here. Roughly 181,000 in costs. It's been reviewed by Public Works. Those that the invoices have been submitted, and uh, they have looked at them and deemed them to be correct. So, um, Board of Public Works approved this and, and feel this is in uh, this is in in line with the uh, agreement we have with the developer. All right. Any questions or comments at all? I have a question. Yeah, is, is this, um, this is common to do this, to reimburse them? I don't know. Um, it is well, yeah, because... it, it is, you know, oversizing is pretty common. You know, you see it more on water mains, you know, where a developer comes in and, and we we see future future development down the road, we'll ask them to oversize it and then we'll pay the we'll pay the difference. So it's it's kind of a cost savings that uh, you know, versus putting it in at the normal size and having to come in and replace it. So you, you'll see this. Uh, I think it, I've seen it quite a few times in, in my in my time on Board of Public Works. It's not much different than paying for Ochala to go all the way through. We want that as a city. The developer doesn't, and they wouldn't yeah. put that in. We want that a bigger, a bigger interceptor, so we have to pay for the extra. Jay? You, usually as development happens further, um, it'll get charged back to the developer. So for instance, on Sion Road, we put a big, we, we had an oversized interceptor put in down the railroad tracks and that interceptor stops right about Lacey Road right now. So when development happens south of Lacey Road going further down, the developer of what's now the Hartung property and some of those other properties will, will have to pay back uh, the cost of that, of that oversizing. Because the, the, it's not, it's technically not really oversizing, it's just sizing for the future because we know there's gonna be future uses down there. All right, don't see anyone else, so all in favor say aye. 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 And oppose nay. All right, that's approved, next one, Dave. Next, uh, I'll move approval resolution R22921, accepting subdivision. Nope, 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 nope. nope. 21321. 213, where am I here? Number oh, two. 213, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead here. Move approval resolution R two thirteen twenty one, approving a first amendment to the agreement for subdivision improvements in the inspiration at Swan Creek certified survey map. Second. Second. Signed by Jay. The public works approved. I believe we did. And planning commission approved as well. I know that. Yes. All right. And do you want to speak to this one, Dave? Uh, I'll try. Um, you know, most, many times on these subdivision sub. Um, on these agreements, subdivision agreements, uh, there'll be amendments made over the course of, uh, by the time it gets fully fully developed, and they're requesting an amendment here for the phasing of the public facilities facilities that are installed in the subdivision. If you look in the uh, 
packet material, you'll you'll kind of see a phasing plan. It's a little um, uh, it's a little complicated. It, it doesn't really jump out at you, but uh, it it is consistent with other things that I've seen on on projects like this. Yep. Yeah, we do this a lot. This is the project off the East Sherrill and Swan Creek. Yep. A big open field there. All right. Don't see anyone else. So I'll go right to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, that's approved. Next one. Next, I'll move approval of resolution R229-21, accepting subdivision improvements in the plat of second edition to Stoner Prairie. Second. All right, signed by Randy. And did Public Works approve this one? Yes, we did. All right, what's this one about? Uh, they are, this lot, there'll be uh, 43, 43 lots in, that are approved in this, uh, um, in this resolution, plus there's four out lots. You'll see these. Um, as you go down Lacey Road, you can turn in. I think the, I think the blockade is down now. You can see where these are, are going to be constructed in this uh, and at the south end there of, uh, of the development, the Stoner Prairie development. Excellent. Just west of the school, I think. Yes, right? yes. Yeah, if you look at it, you can also see the kind of the bike path into the, um, into the school area there. You can see that on the, on the map. All right. Jay. Well, I saw on this map, I saw on this map that Outlot 10 um, it says reserved for stormwater purposes, but it doesn't. And I've I've actually had to go do service calls on appliances in this subdivision already, um, and it doesn't look to me like there's a pond there. Is that just a, a swale, or what are we doing there? I don't know, Jay. Uh, I would have to I'd have to refer that to Bill. I've I've um, I don't think he's I don't think he's on, so I'll have to get back to you on that. Let me make a Let me make a note. I can do that for you, Dave, if okay. you'd like. Thank you, Chad. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't want to guess. It might even be for uh, any redoing of Lacey Road, possibly. But we'll find out and get that answer to you. Good question, Jay. Sorry, I can't answer it right now. Anything else? All right. Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. That one's approved. One more, Dave. Okay. Move approval resolution R-230-21, authorizing a revocable occupancy permit for a pylon sign located at 3030 Fish Hatchery Road. Second. Senate by Jade, the public works approved. Public works approved. All right, what's it about? With the uh, uh, widening of Fish Hatchery Road, uh, the, the road right-of-way was, was extended, and uh, retaining wall you know, was moved. And where this sign is, at the top, the sign for which business? I believe it's uh, Dairy, Dairy Queen, Queen. I think yeah. Dairy Queen. Yep. The sign will extend onto that road right of way, um, a small amount. And Board of Public Works looked at that and they said it should not be any problem for any obstruction or, or anything moving forward. So uh, they made the determination that we could uh, authorize authorize this occupancy permit you know, for us for the sign and it is uh, is also revocable you know that in the future you know it could be could be taken back all right any questions or comments on this one all right seeing none all in favor say aye aye, aye. and opposed nay all right that is approved and no other resolutions anything else Dave no nope. all right then we can go to the park commission Julia Approval of resolution R-221-21, approval of pool in place surfacing for the inclusive playground. Second. Senator by Gabriella, the parks approve? Yes. Did finance approve? Finance approved. All right, and you want to speak to this one, Julia? Yeah, uh, Scott, Scott is here, so he yeah. can. All right, Scott, why don't you tell us what's going on here? Very good. Uh, this is, uh, as we continue with the inclusive playground uh, project at McKee Farms Park, uh, one of the components is a, a surfacing, which we're going to do uh, poured in place. Uh, it's 4,200 uh, square feet in total. Uh, we did uh, publicly bid it. We received five proposals. Uh, the low bid came from Meek Surfacing uh, at a cost of $14.90 uh, per square foot, which came to a total of 62 
580, uh, but included in their proposal, uh, typically the proposals are one color and, and one, one black uh, with the two colors, but we, they did include uh, an additional uh, per square foot charge of $1.50 for two colors. Uh, and, and that actually, the Park Commission did decide to accept that. And with that, uh, Meek was still the, uh, the low bid uh, for a total of $68,880. Uh, it, it is noted that we did receive a $52,000 uh, do donation towards the, uh, uh, towards the purchase of, of, this, of this surface area. Excellent. Any questions at all, Jay? I, I'm sure that other people are going to wonder what exactly poured in place surfacing is. In, in, in what it is, is typically what we have in a, the majority, almost all of our playgrounds is mulch or recycled rubber chips. Uh, we do have one poured in place uh, a surfacing at Oak Meadow Park. It, basically what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a rubber. It's a, a, you know, rubber that's probably eight inches thick. Uh, but it, but it's fully accessible. Uh, so wheelchairs and, and those kinds of things. Uh, wood chips is a, are accessible, but poured in, in place is the most accessible surfacing that you can uh, that you can have. And then actually, it does uh, for for fall protection. It it is resilient enough that if people do fall from the highest uh, playground uh, structure, consumer safety product standards are met for for fall protection. So it's just a different type of uh, type of surfacing. It is definitely more, it's more expensive. Uh, that's for sure. Any other questions or comments? All right, I'm happy to see this project going forward. So seeing nothing else, we can go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, that is approved. Next one, Julia. Approval of resolution R-22-21, updating the 2022 fee schedule and also add the pickable court rental fee and the new park shelter rental fee schedule. Second. Seconded by Gabriella. Do parks approve? Yes. The finance approve? Finance approve. All right. And do you want to speak to this, Scott, again? Uh, it's called um, right. Park Commission. Um, made a friendly amendment. I don't know, Scott, you can speak to that and then, okay. Sure, uh, and, and again, uh, as the mayor indicated with uh, the addition of the pickleball courts, we needed to create the, the fee for that. Uh, and we did take the opportunity to take a look at the uh, park shelter rental fee schedule, which is cumbersome. It, it's actually five tiers of, of different uh, different costs. So what the Park Commission is doing is recommending that we go to a two-tier system, uh, which will really make it uh, easier for staff to navigate along with the customers uh, to navigate. And the two, uh, the two tiers are one to 99 as far as number of, of uh, rental or number of people that are going to be at the, the, the rental and then 100 and above. Uh, but what we also did is uh, in the past, if there was a, a large event, uh, say a four or five day event, they were only charged that one $900. If you recall, we had a large event, $900 fee. Uh, and independent of how many days they had the event, it was that $900. So uh, in the, in the, uh, through the lens of equity, it's if a customer rents the, the park on that day, then they're going to have to pay, uh, pay the fee. Uh, we did do a, a, a cost analysis, actually ran, ran all of the 2021 park shelter rentals uh, through this, this new pay uh, tier system. And, and we actually, there was a little bit more revenue that was generated. And actually, uh, if you do look at your, your packet, uh, the, the two tier system, what we did uh, to also create equity is we raised the Hugo Jamestown indoor rental rate by $25 so that it equaled uh, the McKee indoor rate. Uh, and with, uh, we had 68, I believe, 68 Hugo Jamestown rentals uh, in 2021. So with that $25 increase, we get $1,700 uh, 
uh, in addition uh, to what we received this year. Uh, and then to Julia's uh, comment, uh, the Park Commission did amend uh, that fee schedule to include uh, Hugo Jamestown uh, along with uh, McKee and McGaw. Uh, they're, they're eligible for that large event tier, uh, but the Park Commission did want to include Hugo Jamestown in that same in that same tier. So that was that's what the friendly amendment was. Motion to include the amendment from Parks Commission or not? Because you could move it with that change from Parks versus having to do now a, a separate amendment to it. So I guess but it's, it's coming with the amendment, isn't it? So, so you approve. So your motion was as well, amended by Parks. The, yeah, as a part. As, as Parks amended. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So I want to mention that that in Parks Commission we spent kind of like one two hours discussing the and we did those the numbers and so believe me we have a plenty discussion about this and so finally we came out with an idea you know everyone was on on the same page and I agree with the you know with the and we review all the other fees that they're coming in the package too because we are approving all of the fees so I've got Randy and then Jay Randy go ahead uh, finance also approved with the the friendly amendment oh, okay. uh, to reflect the parks yeah. amendment. Okay. Just to, for the record, All right. Jay. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question for you, Scott, or for Misty, but does the revenue from these still go into the general fund? That's a good question. Go ahead. Would you like me to answer? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. The revenue for all of the park shelter rentals as well as the community center rentals and the recreation program fees all go into the general fund as well as all the expenses to provide that service i guess i just had one question on the under 100 versus over 100 is that necessary i only ask just because are you creating a a situation where it's not like we check it, I guess, and it's not a big deal, but if someone is gonna be 200, are they saying they're 100 and less just because they don't wanna pay the extra fee? Is, is it, I guess, is it necessary to have that tier there or not? And I don't know, it sounds like you maybe talked about it since you talked about it for over an hour, but just one question I had is, is that how necessary is that over versus under 100? But, you know, yeah, we discussed all of that and it's a risk, but did you look at the current um, reservation fee, you had different, also different bucket, I would say bucket of from one to 49, 50 to 100, you know what I mean? So people can, you know, they can tell you, yes, we are a 49 people event and they are a 100. So, you know, we don't have a way to control that, but we already have that in place, something like that. So. And we're getting rid of it, or at least simplifying it. I'm just wondering if there's a reason, a need to further simplify it, just so it completely takes that out of it. Yeah. So. And, yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments or anything changes? All right. Seeing none, then we can go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right. That is approved. And one more, Julia. I move approval of resolution R-223-21, amending the 2021 general fund and capital project fund budget. We are reinstating the parking lot, resurfacing facing and park vehicle funding from collective recreational programming fees. Second. Second. Senator Gabriella, the parks approve? Yes. The finance proof. Finance approved. All right, and do you want to speak this? Or yeah, I can, I can start and Scott and Misty can continue this. In 2000, for the, I think for the new elders, uh, in 2020, uh, we have, the city had to decide that if we are gonna lay off two, uh, the two staff in recreational department. So we decided not to do it, but we had to find the money in other places. So the money was coming from the, um, the, what is the, um, oh, I forgot. the parking lot, resort fencing, and, and vehicle. So in 2021, uh, we were able to collect the money back. So what we are doing is we're putting back the money in those buckets again. So this is practically what we're doing. I don't know, Misty, do you want to add something? Mm -hmm. Mr. Scott, go ahead. 
Yes, I guess just from a mechanics perspective, so the budget amendment was approved in January, and this amendment reverses that that amendment that was approved before. Basically, go back to as adopted originally. And that's because we have the money from the recreation programs essentially so that we didn't want to assume at the beginning of the year. Okay. Exactly. Yep. All right. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. Aye. And opposed nay. All right. That's approved. Anything else for parks, Julia? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. Then we can move on to the library board. We are meeting tomorrow. Excellent. Commission on Aging Well. Uh, we met last week. Um, we got an update from from the director, and uh, surprisingly, you know, there many many things are very well attended. You know, they, they have a lot of usage, which you'd, you'd think it would be down, but uh, they're very busy. Uh, they finalized, or we we approved our our mission statement and vision statements for the senior center, and. Um, I guess the big thing you've seen it in in the star and, and other people you know about transportation and um, we did, we touched on a little bit I asked Jill to maybe reach out you know we have a large number of senior housing going in in Fitchburg you know uh, it's a considerable number and I said let's get them to the table here and, and let's let's have a talk about what you know how we can do this can they, they any sum up some of them thought about having their own buses and uh, let, let's get everyone at the table before we make any any decisions and, and figure out what's the most cost-effective way to serve our seniors. That's all I had. All right. Question, Julia? Yeah, a question for Have you discussed about, because they, yeah, they, they, they want a bus for next year. Um, and the question is, the friends of the senior center, are they planning to fundraise um, some of this money? Because a bus is going to be pretty expensive. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, I, you know, they've, you know, they do a great job fundraising. I don't, I don't anticipate that they could raise that much, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, that's why I want to talk to these, you know, these buildings that are going up, large, you know, senior housing that are going to, we'll need, we need to get them at the table also. We'd like to talk to the county about it more. Uh, I, I think we have to get a lot of people, get a lot of thoughts, you know, I don't, I don't understand, frankly, Julia, I don't understand the, the issue of the financing well enough. You know, I, I know the goal is to have a, have a bus, but uh, how we're going to pay for that, that's, that's where, you know, it's like make, making sausage. You, you don't want to see how it's done, but you want a good result. <laughs> All right. Maybe time to move on. <laughs> how about RCC? <laughs> Uh, we did not meet uh, since the last meeting, but I did want to just mention a couple of recycling things. The city feature just announced recently that paper cups, those ones that you get your coffee in and your soda in, can be recycled now. Uh, they've been recyclable for a while, but Pelletier didn't have the technology to actually separate it out of the stream, so it was used to be considered garbage that was contamination. However, now they are recyclable, so go ahead and make sure you clean it out, but put it in a recycling bin just as is, and you, they're recyclable now, so good news there. And then also the city of Fitchburg has a holiday recycling guide, which I find very useful. Um, a couple of notes there that l strings of lights can actually be deposited in a special bin in the city of Fitchburg front lobby. If you have unusable strings of light, those can be um, recycled somewhat. And then there are dates um, for tree pickup. That's part of the brush and brush fees that you pay for. Um, is includes Christmas tree pickup um, on two different weeks in January. So please um, look up those dates and put them on your calendar so you don't miss that. Um, and then all sorts of different things. Um, if you don't know if something is recyclable, go ahead and search Holly Holiday Recycling Guide on Fitchburg website, and you will probably find your answer there because it's very comprehensive. And that's all for RCC. All right, what about TTC? Yeah, TTC met on December 9th, and it was a good meeting. We had our new member who we appointed last time attended. Um, we talked pretty extensively about the Madison Metro bus service, or the new transit service agreement, which I've been giving you updates on throughout the year. That's in more final form. Um, so we reviewed that, gave some feedback. I believe that Andrew and Misty and Valerie are working on the final details with Madison Metro, and it'll be referred out at a council meeting sometime in January for a vote at some point 
in January or February is my understanding. So if anyone's curious about that, I'm happy to send the link of the discussion or even the text. Just let me know. It will be referred out before we vote on it. So you'll see the text prior to that. Um, and then we also talked about priority transit areas, but bus transit areas in Fitchburg because um, Metis Metro is still working on their network re redesign. So uh, we were just kind of talking about where where are the places that are really key that bus service can't be lost in Fitchburg because of how integral it is to the system and, and to people that live here and, and that use the bus system. We talked a little bit about that and then hopefully Metro will actually put together, they have lots of draft maps, but they'll put something together that's more of a, in a final form that can um, garner public feedback. So that'll be coming next year. But just so you know that any changes, actual functional changes to the bus system, probably wouldn't happen until 2023 at the earliest, just because there's a lot of lead time in terms of once you make that decision, so much has to happen to actually execute that, that the delay is quite extensive, um, even once those decisions are made. And then, oh, and then the application for, for funding, um, direct state funding for transit assistance that we approved last month um, was put in. So we expect to hear early next year about whether or not we, we receive that direct funding which will be a positive for us financially. And that is all for TTC. All right, uh, Sita, I'm not sure who's gonna give an update today. You could go first, Julia. You could go first. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so, okay. so we are gonna share. Um, so we discussed in Sida. we met on December 9th. Um, so we discussed a resolution that we just passed about the Ochala Drive uh, mixed use project. We have a good discussion there. We have um, LS presentation there too. Then we have a pre uh, every year the Fitchburg Chamber of Commerce come to give us a presentation about what they have done during the year. So, um, so Angela was in the meeting um, and the presentation is in the package. And then we talk about um, something, a new initiative that the city is, um, is trying to, um, you know, trying to do for next year with uh, the, is, um, is the bike committee and also uh, Fitch for Bike. They're part of this, uh, working in this initiative to bring the bicycle. cycle. So uh, yes. you want to talk about the bicycle? cycle? Right. Sure, that's something that um, I think is very exciting, you know, for bicycle. cycle um, That's a, uh, owned by Trek and they provide the um, e-bikes um, that you're now seeing around Madison, and you really want to expand that to um, Fitchburg. And what their proposal is, is for um, CETA to help pay for the infrastructure um, to bring those bikes here. And they're looking at, um, for their initial phase, I have it here of different locations, which are the neighborhood hub, Cahill, Maine, McKee Farm Parks, Sub-Zero, Woods Hollow, Avante um, Properties, and Terra Vesa. Um, the program, I think, is excellent. I mean, you could get passes, a monthly pass, an annual pass, um, pretty reasonable, you know, and each time you take a bike out, it's about um, 60 minutes that you get to ride and you can extend that time. Uh, what Madison is doing, I thought, you know, give them um, some props, you know, you can actually um, get a bike loaned to you from some of the libraries where you can have that uh, for, for a week. And if you've seen these bikes around, it started with the red bikes, um, but now they're e-bikes. Um, they're all over the place. And you go by some of these docks that they have now. I mean, you can hardly, I mean, it's maybe one or two bikes in those things now. Um, I've seen a lot of people, you know, who work downtown in, in Madison actually park their cars um, near uh, one of the stations and then ride their bikes to go to work, you know, in the center of downtown because parking being so expensive. Um, but it's really exciting. They want to kind of, you know, connect the networks of the, you know, bike paths that we have in Fitchburg. And it's something that um, I, I think would be a positive thing um, for Fitchburg. So I don't know if anybody else want to add anything, Julia, if I miss something. Yeah, we'll no, be talking I a lot more about the B-cycle options and right. program. Yeah, I want to add that this is the, f there are two phases. So the first phase is the one, the station that um, Jim mentioned, but the second phase is gonna be looking at the west part of the city to, to install more um, stations, uh, docking stations, they call it. Um, so um, yeah, so Ansida has already $50,000 in a, in a fund that we are planning to use. And then we need to another, I think it's gonna cost seven, $91,000 to install. 
Yeah. yeah there, there's two options. Option yeah. one is for uh, 56 um, docking stations at a cost of 99 Oh, yeah. okay. Or option two, which is 85 docks oh, yeah. um, for $150,000. Yeah. But, you know, the only thing they want us for assistance for is the infrastructure. They're going to do a lot of marketing and, and trying to get business partners actually to pay for the operating costs. So. All right. And we can move on, if that's all. Uh, Egg and Royal Affairs. Uh, Ag and Rural Affairs, we have not met, uh, so nothing to report, but uh, our next meeting is January 18th right. of 2022. Before we go to EMS, I'd actually wonder if someone would like to do a motion to move up uh, new business 11-3, which is the purchase of a drone. We've got a couple of staff that are here waiting for that. So moved. <laughs> moved by Jay. Second. Second. Seconded by Gabriella. All in favor of adjusting the agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All right. And so we'll first do a motion. Uh, let's see. It looks like either finance or public safety. Someone want to do the motion? Randy, you want to do I'm, the motion? Sure. All right. All right. Make sure I have the right one. Motion to approve resolution R-236-21 accepting a donation for the purchase of a drone. Second that motion. Seconded by Dave. And welcome, unless you want to hang out for longer, but I figured I'd <laughs> move you guys up. But go ahead, Joe, why don't you tell us what's going on? I appreciate the efficiencies. Um, yeah, this is actually an exciting project for us. Uh, some of you may remember about two budget cycles ago, uh, it, we brought a drone project, a shared drone project. It was a city, uh, project that was shared by multiple departments. Uh, we chose as a city not to fund it municipally, but um, it was given the, uh, the instructions, the direction to try to find alternative funding. And so we've looked into a couple of different options and over the past two years, we've looked at a couple of uh, potential grants and, and things like that. And, and then we uh, were lucky enough to have a donor step up over the past month Dr. Jim Burby and his wife, uh, uh, Karen Walsh, have, uh, have decided to, to fund this project for the city of Fitchburg. What they like about it is some of the things that I've already shared with you is it's is not just public safety. This isn't just police and fire. This is city engineering. This is Department of Public Works. It's uh, uh, community development uh, and FACT TV all of which uh, allows us to have a more sustainable program. And it's sustainable for a number of different reasons. Uh, more flight hours, more familiarity, the ability to, to operate um, independent of emergency operations and actually prepare a little bit better for emergency operations. And I'll give you one example. Uh, Dakota Dorn is uh, somebody who runs our GIS right now. Uh, through city engineering. Uh, he is able to use mapping functions on that drone to be able to better predict what things will look like in the future, water flow, things like that, uh, that give us a better idea of what we would need to do in the event of an emergency, just for an example, like flooding. So those are some examples of how it's being used. All departments will contribute to its ongoing maintenance operation and eventual replacement. And that will be done through a fund similar to our fleet maintenance. So we can gradually put money into that, that uh, operating budget. It's capital equipment, but uh, allows us to gradually put money in that so we're not, we're not buying this equipment all at once. And it allows it to be, like I said, just a little bit more sustainable because there's more players. Jeremy, anything you want to add at all? No, All right. Uh, I forgot to ask, did public safety approve? And did finance approve? Finance approved. All right. Uh, there are questions, comments at all? Jay? There was a, um, there was a really good uh, PowerPoint presentation in the public safety. I guess it's in the council packet also that um, it would be, if you haven't looked at it, take a look at it because it provides a lot of good information. One thing I would share is that is the original PowerPoint point that was shared with the council about two years ago. We have found equipment that is um, more economical. Uh, it's a lower price point, uh, and the donation that we're receiving is going to be able to provide 
the uh, the the funds for all of the equipment that we're looking for to include the engineering add-ons. Okay. Um, I assume we have a policy on usage, meaning you know you couldn't surveil a private residence without a warrant, that type of thing. You know, I've had residents concern, and I, I I assume you've thought you you've thought this out already. Yeah, we've actually reached out to a number of different entities, not only Wisconsin Emergency Management, Capitol Police. The policies that we have in place are going to be consistent with what we see throughout the state. It takes into consideration flight time, training, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. We take into consideration civil liberties uh, that would require us in order to surveil to identify things like warrants. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Jim. Jill, as far as calling people out, um, I see you got four uh, departments that's going to use it, three pilots per and as per department. Am I understanding that correct? Uh, not necessarily three pilots per department. Uh, for example, city engineering, right now we have one, maybe two uh, with the new GIS position that's coming on board that, uh, that would likely be pilots. Uh, Fact TV would have two to three, maybe more. Uh, the fire department's not going to have all that many, uh, and the same thing with the, the police department. But it does give us, uh, the, the training, uh, all told, is not all that expensive uh, based on how the FAA has uh, outlined and made that available uh, for about 150 200 a pilot. So, yeah, it's, it's not all that expensive. There will be reoccurring and ongoing training to include flight time. Okay, that's where I was mainly going with it. Yep. Give these pilots the um, the flight time, you know, so that they're actually rotating through and actually getting that experience. Absolutely, it's one reason you want to have uh, the ability to have a little bit of depth, but not too much. Yep. Also, members will not be on the list of authorized pilots. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and one other thing that I wanted to say is we really should be able to hit the ground running uh, with this within the first quarter. Now, that doesn't allow us to do everything that the drone is capable of doing until we have enough training hours behind the controls. One more thing. As far as um, I can see other entities probably asking to assist. So I'm assuming there will be some mutual aid agreements in place? There will be mutual aid because of the fact that even though we have our own program, a lot of times what you need to do is you need to piggyback those systems so that you can keep drones in the air because they only have a limited battery time. So there will still be uh, a mutual aid. And we'll require it initially because we'll only have a limited capability initially, maybe on the periphery, until we are able to do things like fly over buildings and people based on our training time. Uh, I, I think I speak on behalf of everybody here that just thanks the Bur Burby Walsh family for, for stepping up and providing this funding. I mean, I'm a big believer that data, more data is better and that imaging data is incredibly valuable and in, as you've said, in so many different ways in the city. And uh, I, I'm certainly excited to see what our new GIS position in association with this drone um, could potentially do to, to have a better understanding of how to how to make this city run well. So thanks to the Burby Walsh family for, for stepping up. Yeah, and although this is independent of the foundation, this is uh, uh, Dr. Burby and Karen doing this as individuals, it does fall in line with some of the technological aspects that he has brought into the city. All right, seeing no one else, we can go ahead to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, that is approved. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, back to the agenda here. Uh, EMS, Shannon is not here tonight. Bicycle Committee, Joe. Um, I have been on vacation, so we did, while we did have a meeting earlier this month, I um, unfortunately was unable to attend, but the minutes uh, should be up on the website. Probably talked about the B-Cycle program, I'm guessing, along with CETA. All right, tree advisory then. No report. All right, uh, landmarks is not my probably anyway. Housing advisory, Jill. Um, same, so the um, minutes should be uploaded soon, um, but unfortunately I was not able to make the, the meeting that occurred yesterday. All right, healthy neighborhoods. We, we have not had a meeting since our last gathering here, but we are planning on having one, I think it's January 11th. All right, excellent. 
Uh, Finance Committee, Randy. Yes, the Finance Committee met earlier this evening, <clears throat> proved or reviewed and approved detailed review of all checks issued, checks 122790 or I should say through 122825 for the period of November 16th through the 30th, 2021, totaling 72,679,091 cents. Uh, the next item, detailed review of all ACH payments, November 1st through the 30th, 2021, totaling uh, $544,115.28. And the next, review of P-card transactions for the cycle ending November 8th, 2021, uh, total $301,375,000.74. Moving on to resolutions and ordinances, uh, motion to approve resolution R-215-21, amending the 2021 debt and capital projects fund budgets, unused budgeted interest payment, and unspent 2020A proceeds to reduce debt issuance. Second. Second. Oh. By Dave, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's see. Misty, do you want to yeah. speak to this? Sure. Uh, so we just completed our 2021 debt issuance. We closed on December 1st. Um, but when we went through that process, there were a couple of reasons why I was able to reduce the total amount that we needed to borrow for 2021. And they're identified on the staff memo that was included. Um, but ultimately, it's uh, the interest payment that we budgeted for 2021. Since we didn't borrow until December 1st, we obviously didn't have an interest payment yet in 2021. So we, want, we use that funding then to reduce how much we had to borrow this year. And this budget amendment will transfer that money to those projects that need that funding. Uh, the second piece, which is a bigger amount, is uh, the McKee Road project was borrowed in 2020. And because of savings within the project, we ended up not needing all of the money that we borrowed for that particular road. So worked with Ellers and our bond council um, to make sure that uh, this was in compliance with all of the rules, um, but we are transferring just shy of a million dollars from the 2020 proceeds that was for McKee Road into those three other road projects um, so that we didn't have to borrow so much in 2021. Goal ultimately was to save issuance costs and interest by using that other funding. All right, Dave. Uh, we took some contingency from the key road and applied it to other other projects. Was that was that factored in? That oh, was I as well. Open. Yep. Okay. Jay, did you have a question? Yeah. So, um, the was the it's, so we're using money that we borrowed in 2017 through 2020 to fund what would have been borrowed in this current bond issue. Um, is, was the interest rate lower in those years than it will would be for? what we would be borrowing now? So we're only using money from the 2020 borrowing. Okay. We had borrowed from McKee Road over that whole point, you're right, but I use the money we borrowed first, so then whatever is at the end is what would be available. So it's just the 2020 amount. Okay, so was that bond issue at a lower interest rate than the 2021? I can look that up. My guess is it's comparable. Okay. The so rates have changed all that much in the last year. Did you mention that there are some fees associated with borrowing again this year, and so we're saving some on issuance fees, so that might make up any kind of difference if there is possibly anyway. We can find that out. Yeah, and then if I may too, so we are required to spend the money that we borrow in certain ways, uh, and reapplying that to a road project is one option. The other option would be that we use it to pay down the debt, um, so then we're ultimately still pay the interest for no benefit. So this is the better option financially, even if there is a difference in the interest rate. But I will definitely get those amounts for you. All right. Anything else? Seeing nothing. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right. That one's approved. One more. Yes. Uh, 2B, we've already spoken to. Uh, let's move on to 2C. Motion to approve resolution R-227-21. Network switch replacement. Second. Senator by a J, and what's this one? Uh, this is uh, every seven years, uh, the city, we, we, we uh, 
uh, replace the uh, current equipment, the switches, and just to conform to current security standards. Um, you know, it's, it's critical to the network, and um, from my understanding, it's being, uh, the switches are being replaced in City Hall, second, third floor, community center, uh, what else, maintenance facilities, evidence building, building, in fact, TV. So, uh, so this takes place every seven years. It's kind of critical to the system. So ensuring the reliance, reliability of FACT TV is a big piece. Of yes, absolutely. Hey, yeah, Dave. I just want to make a comment. You know, um, that is a that is a consistent interval. You know, the work I do, uh, there are these switches that are out in electrical substations, and companies are replacing those in a similar interview. So interval. So we, uh, you know, we're being consistent with what's being needed for the security upgrades across the across the country. Okay. Seeing no one else, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, that is approved. Anything else for finance? No, I have nothing I have nothing else. All right, uh, personnel next. Uh, 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 I don't have anything re to report. We haven't met, but um, we are working on, still working on the negotiation with the police and fire uh, union negotiation, so. I don't know, you're going to mention that. Yeah. All right, then we can move on to public safety, Dave. So public safety, uh, tonight we just had one uh, one approval for a routine license uh, that was new, and then we also took up, um, we, we took up an a individual, he had applied, and the police had uh, rejected his application, and uh, we, we discussed it and we gave him another opportunity. So I would, um, I would like to, let's see, is this on the agenda? I would like to move, uh, we postpone, um, postpone the operator, um, operator application uh, for Xander Bowie until the, July, the January 11th meeting. Second. Seconded by Jay. Any further? Discussion or anything else you want to add to it? Just kind of. No, we, you know, um, he had incomplete information and not submit everything. So the police department uh, rejected it, and uh, we basically were given one more chance to get the form right. And if he if he does, uh, then we'll evaluate it. If he doesn't, then it's going to be six months. I, I guess it would, would be the interval. So we're, this kind of is. We're, get, we're giving them a lot of rope here. You know, we want to allow someone to work if they want to work. All right. See nothing else. All in favor of postponing the application for Xavier Bowie till January. Say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right. That is postponed. Anything else for public no. safety? All right. Then moving on to mayor's reports. Uh, let's see, Chad mentioned the holiday light tour this weekend, map coming out on Friday. That's always very popular. Lots of great houses out there I've seen already. We're also in uh, negotiations with our police and fire union. We actually have a tentative agreement with our police department and their union. And we're hoping on Thursday to have a tentative agreement with the fire department, fingers crossed. And then we can have some uh, great contracts for those employees. Other than that, uh, happy holidays. We don't have a meeting, obviously, in two weeks, but we'll see you in January. And then I just also wanted to thank uh, Lisa Sanford for a couple things. One, for organizing the event tonight with the police and fire department recognition. And also, she's putting a ton of work for the Holiday Lights the tour. She started that last year as her kind of brainchild and has been very popular uh, last year and is popular again this year. I think is a great annual tradition for Fitchburg. So I just wanted to thank all her for all the work she did. And we can go to all the reports and we'll start with District 3, Jay. Well, I don't, I don't have anything specific for District 3 tonight, but uh, in my previous iteration on the council, I used to do something every year at this time, uh, and that is to give all of the council members virtual gifts for Christmas. So, <laughs> so I, have, I have a gift for all of you, uh, for all of you people that I see every two weeks. So, so uh, Dave, uh, I'm giving you uh, four busy intersections with complete pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. All right. Now, 
Now, Dave is getting the most expensive gift on the list. Wow. And it's not because I love him any more than the rest of you. It's just because I've known him longer. Uh, Joe, you get uh, full funding for a teen center and all involved studies. <laughs> Julia, I, I had the hardest time coming up with something for you, but I decided that you need a solution to all of Fitchburg's stormwater issues. Gabriella, I, uh, yours was the easiest. You, you get a semi-full of street trees and prairie plantings, but no Dutch elms or ash trees. <laughs> uh, Chad, you're getting a full year with no employee complaints. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a pipe dream. <laughs> Aaron, uh, you're getting a pair of Reebok Premier walking shoes. They're stylish but practical and suitable for statewide campaigning. <laughs> Tracy, you get a full year without any criticism about how elections are held in Fitchburg. <laughs> uh, Misty, you're getting a giant budget surplus and outperforming tids. Uh, if Shannon was here, I would have given her uh, a new improved council meetings that take 25% less time and pack more nutrients into each morsel. <laughs> Jim, you're getting three full-time firefighters. Great, thank you. <laughs> and Randy, I had a little trouble with yours, but I finally settled on, uh, you, you're getting a pallet of large orange, si orange signs with the text that reads, slow the F down. <laughs> so that is my gift to you. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, let's see, Jim, go ahead. Nothing to report. All right, Randy? Nothing to report, but other than to uh, wish everyone a happy holiday. All right, Joe. Excuse me, I'm on my phone, my computer has crashed uh, the minute I started my vacation, so it must have been a good sign. Um, so uh, tonight, earlier at 7, we had um, the introduction to uh, eight student interns for the Teen Center, as well as a um, overview of the project for the community engagement study. Um, it's on FACT TV, on their Facebook Live. So I would encourage folks to check it out. Um, I think it'll also be eventually uploaded to the Fact TV website. So um, the other thing is uh, Luna's Groceries is having a toy drive. So um, if anybody is interested in donating toys to kids in the neighborhood, um, they'll be distributed a couple of days prior to Christmas. And um, we take toys from anywhere from uh, 18 down to um, infants. So, uh, if you can do that, you can stop by the store and um, drop off toys. All right, Dave. Uh, the Jamestown Neighborhood Association, uh, Jeff Rollinger, uh, um, you go, you'll find his uh, uh, the, uh, the year-end uh, newsletter or the uh, fourth quarter newsletter, um, talking about quite a few things going on. And something kind of interesting, uh, and I don't know, I'll have to rely on Mr. Brecklin to help me navigate this. I've had several complaints from residents about uh, poultry, namely roosters. And it was my understanding that, you know, I grew up on a farm and that roosters were not allowed in, in urban, but I'm, I'm told that Fitchburg has no such ban. And uh, I, I, I need to find out how we change the ordinance to incorporate that. And so I don't, I don't need your reply now, but. Uh, I'll offer one real okay. quick. So. Uh, we do have an ordinance that does uh, require folks to keep uh, animals like fowl uh, from unnecessarily disturbing the peace. Um, so that is something that we currently do have in our ordinances that could be utilized, at least in the case of roosters. Although this issue has been recently presented to me by another uh, alder. Um, so I've engaged in some preliminary conversations with our city attorney and our interim zoning administrator. Uh, to potentially look to uh, identify some uh, potential solutions. Uh, but I do want to be clear in that Fitchburg is uh, obviously positioned very uniquely as it relates to other suburban communities in that we have a, a rural portion of our community and we certainly would not want to do anything uh, to complicate uh, anyone in our rural uh, farm community um, from having yep. chickens and or roosters. So we'll have to look at how we look to craft that language uh, with the intent of largely uh, focusing that on 
uh, perhaps urban service area or um, you know lots of a particular size, less than a particular size or zoned residential or those sorts of things. Thank you. Something coming soon. Uh, Julia, go ahead. So we are not a friendly rooster community? Yet. No. <laughs> To mention something that I forgot from parks, so because I know there are some neighbors that they are anxious about this, the Stony Prairie Park design, uh, the city already received three proposals. For the design of the park, um, there is going to be an interview panel um, uh, with three firms that they are the, with some recommendation, and the funding will be presented in the January, January 22 meeting. So for the folks of the Stony Prairie, neighborhood that they are, you know, maybe asking what happened with the park. We're working on that. So the other thing I want to mention, I don't have too much to mention for my district, but I want to uh, also say uh, happy holiday, Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año Nuevo. Uh, and also I want to thank all the city staff for the, uh, you know, for the hard work this year, especially under the, we continue under COVID. And I know people, some people are putting long hours and working from home and dealing with a lot of stuff. So I want to thank all the city staff from your hard work. Um, I am very proud to work with all of you. Um, you know, we are working in a great city. And um, so thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Okay, uh, yeah, nothing to report for the for the for um, my district as a whole, but I just wanted to wish all y'all here a happy new year and happy holidays. I. You know, we spend some time reflecting on the previous year at this time of year. And I'm, I'm pretty, it's always, it's kind of amazing to look back and think of all we've accomplished this year um, and all the conversations we've had and sometimes the tough conversations, but also like the good moments where we've accomplished a lot. And um, I really enjoy working with you all. This is a great group of people that loves this city. And uh, I've, I've just really appreciated everybody's commitment and, and time. And so to thank you to all of you here uh, that are here with us and here with me. And I uh, hope you all have a, a nice break and a great holiday season. And I look forward to seeing you all again in January. All right, moving on to new business. Would someone like to do a motion for the first item? Gabrielle, go ahead. I move approval of resolution R-231-21, a resolution appointing election inspectors for years 2022 to 2023. Senator by Julia. Tracy, is there something you like to speak to? I think we have to do this every couple of years. Yes, this is just a standard procedure. Every two years, their oaths are due. Um, it's just reappointing them for the 2022-2023 years. All right, any questions? Julia? Yeah, do we have to? because I don't remember seeing Every this. Every two years. Two years. Yeah. Oh, maybe I forgot. Okay. All right. Seeing nothing else, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right. That's approved. Let's see. This one's finance. So, Randy, you want to do this one? Um, motion to approve resolution R-234-21, approving a contract with Dane County to accept 2022 neighborhood navigator funding. Second. Senator by J. Did finance approve? Finance approved. All right. Do you want to speak to this? Uh, I'm trying to recall what we've. I can uh, do it otherwise if you want. Uh, sure, if you'd like to, if you want to go into further detail, other than I just have a short summary. Go ahead. Yeah, I, this is something we do every year. We get this money from the county. I've talked to staff. We know this is coming. We've always done it as a direct referral. We really don't need to if we know this is coming every year. So a future years, it would be nice to refer it. But this is money that we get for two individuals that uh, both actually speak Spanish and do a lot of work in the North Fish Hatchery Road area. I believe there are, there, I just saw something the other day that one of the individuals did a lot with. So it's a great program for us and a great way to do a lot more outreach to the North Fish Hatchery Road neighborhood. Julia. Yeah. So this is a part of the Healthy Neighborhood Initiative program, too. Yep. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Oh, apparently there is a vacancy. One of the individuals left. So if you know someone who would be interested, that is, do you know if it's posted or not? It is posted. Okay, great. It's posted on the website. If they have any questions, they can contact Sarah, maybe Wade, or even Chad. Could help them out. <laughs> All right.
seeing no other comments or questions, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed nay? Aye. All right, that's approved. We did number three already. Number four, Randy? Sure, motion to approve resolution R-237-21, adopting the schedule to complete an ARPA TID closure spending plan. Second. Seconded by Jay. And would you like the finance approved? Finance approved. And do you want to speak to this or let Misty? No, we're going to have Misty. Misty, go all right. Go ahead, Misty. Sure. So first, clarify. So finance did not approve. They sent it oh. on to council without a recommendation. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, what's in front of you tonight is a proposed schedule to complete the ARPA and TID closure spending plan. Now we've talked a lot about needing or wanting to do this process, especially through the budget process and all of that. Um, so this is just a proposed schedule to get that done in the first quarter of 2022. It would start with a kickoff at the January Committee of the Whole meeting, where I would give a presentation to all of you as well as the public about the different funding sources, what the rules are, you know, what best practices are, just to kind of lay some context for the conversation we would continue to have. Uh, shortly thereafter, the, uh, the rest of the process would follow a traditional budget kind of schedule. So shortly after the kickoff, the mayor would release his proposed spending plan. Uh, we would have a special finance committee meeting of which all of you would be encouraged to attend uh, where we would discuss the mayor's proposed plan. Uh, the next council meeting, there would be a public hearing for the public to weigh in on the mayor's plan. Uh, after that, council would have an opportunity to put in amendments to what they would like to see changed. I would have the February Committee of the Whole meeting would be where we would discuss all of those council amendments. And then the following council meeting would be another public hearing where the public could weigh in on those council amendments and then go through those amendments just like we do budget. So one by one, up or down, uh, amend them as necessary. At the end of it, then would hopefully have a spending plan for those two funding sources. Uh, one big piece I wanna point out though is that this is just a spending plan. So it's not a budget, uh, it's not, a authority necessarily to spend it. This would be that first step that would then uh, direct staff to explore those different priorities of the council. Um, so basically trying to have council set those priorities before uh, we go through more detail about how to actually implement them. And I think, you know, when we talked and I talked to staff, the, my perception was that, you know, this council, we talked a lot about different things we wanted to use these funds for. And so it made a lot of sense to try and set this agenda and set those, um, I guess, preferences before the elections. And so that's kind of what's pushing it. It's you know, maybe a little quicker than we'd like. However, we thought it was important to do this with this council because there's a lot of things that we talked about essentially promising to put in with these funds. And so we wanted to make sure that we did this before elections. So. I have uh, Jay and then Julia. Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment about this TID closure. Um, I was on the council when we created that TID and one of the projects that I wanted to get done in that TID was to bury the power lines that go down uh, PD that are now on 60 foot towers above everything. And there was a bunch of resistance to that. Uh, and, you know, we did the calculations. We had, an, we, we had started working on an agreement with ATC where they were willing to bear some of the cost for putting that 138 kilovolt line underground so we wouldn't have 60-foot towers going down PD. Uh, and there were a number of very short-sighted council members who said, no, no, we don't want to do that. We can't afford that. And we, even though we had the numbers to show that we could do it, and here we've got three million dollars, which would have been slightly more than what it would than what our share would have been to bury those power lines, uh, we didn't do it. So I know everyone's excited about spending the three million dollars on other projects that we have coming up now, and that's great. But in my view, we should have had a longer view back then and use this money correctly. We can't do it now because the road's been rebuilt and everything's, you know, it would have had to have been done back then. But it's just so disappointing every time I drive down that road and I see those 60 foot towers 
And it's like, you know, we could have made our city look a lot better, but, but people didn't want to do it. So here we are. Julia. Uh, yeah, so I have a couple of concerns about this time frame. Um, I want to make some comments. Um, first, um, you know, in order for us to know how to use the ARPA funds, we need to know uh, the documentation about ARPA, what we can do with ARPA, okay? What are the projects that we can do? What are the things that we cannot do? And I think we, do, we haven't received any documentation yet to go through. I have read on my own some stuff, but you know, it will be nice that we receive the information to determine, first of all, what is ARPA? What, how, what are the projects that, uh, that we can, uh, you know, spend that money? Uh, if there are some limitation or no, all of that. Second, my understanding when we talk about the ARPA fund is we, 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 we would like to work all of us together as a council to come up with a list. So here is that the mayor is gonna propose an ARPA spending plan and then it's gonna work like a budget that we are gonna come with some, um, you know, amendment. So, um, so that one is my, I'm, maybe my, my understanding way back was different, but this is what I have in mind when we discuss how we're gonna use the ARPA and the TIT money, that we are gonna work as a whole, as a team, um, create a list. Um, the other thing I, I am looking is the time frame. I know that you want to do it before the election, but the time frame is unrealistic because First of all, is there are not too much uh, time between uh, when we propose the list and then the public hearing is one week, so we can promote this to the public so they can come and read it, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes public hearing, you need at least to have two or three weeks so people, we can outreach the people and they know that there's gonna be a public hearings and this is other thing that we're gonna talk. I think I am looking at this, is one week some of us here, we work full-time job, and we are, I am, you know, so we have only 10 days to come up with amendments. Um, and, you know, so I am concerned about, I know I understand that you want to do this before the election, but I think it's too compressed. Uh, and I want to know if this is gonna have some flexibility because if we put something and then, you know, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of things coming from the federal government to a state and local municipality yet that we don't know. That my concern is that maybe we are gonna uh, lock our selling project that maybe we can get the money through grant. So, so that one is um, um, one of my biggest concerns. There is another bill that is still in this, uh, you know, on the Congress that we don't know what it's gonna entitle, but it's gonna bring a lot of money to, to a state and local municipality. So my question is, um, I, am, I, I don't feel comfortable to approving this the way it is because I think we are, uh, you know, we need more time to digest this. We need to know, we need time to learn about what is, what we can do with ARPA funds. Um, and then, you know, and give us a little time to alter to come up with a, the list, you know, uh, I think it's, is there, you know, look at, the, I don't know, you can put the time frame on the screen, but it's, it's kind of like, it is not, no, it's not too much time between one thing and the other one, one meeting and the other one, public hearing to, you know what I mean? So I am very concerned because I, will, I also want to involve the community in this, you know, and I don't think that we are gonna have enough, enough time to involve the community in this process either. So this is my concern. Yeah, we had a short conversation about this in finance before we moved it to council. And I, I agree that I think it's too compressed of a schedule. So I actually sent an email out to all to everyone just a few minutes ago with an alternate potential schedule. Um, just trying to spread it out more because I, I think there's there's two things. I, I think it, we should start as early in January as possible. Just at least getting it all on the table, talking about what this funding could be used for, what the ARPA rules are. And then that once that's there, then the council members can think about it, the committee members can think about it, and the public has a chance to think about what this could be spent on. Um, and so I think that first week in January, I guess the first week is, I, I basically chunk this into like different weeks that are coming up. I think if we do something the week of January 3rd or the week of January 10th, we would have the opportunity to 
give ourselves more time to do public outreach and also for the alders ourselves to actually think through these things. Um, I also think that we should refer this to every committee that's gonna meet in that time frame, so that the committees have a, a directed discussion item so they can talk about from their perspective what potential projects are uh, with, with the stipulation that they should submit written feedback to the mayor for consideration. Um, and the other thing is that I, I really would love to have um, <clears throat> a discussion at Committee of the Whole um, which I think the January one obviously makes sense, but I'd like to have that discussion with enough time for Aaron, for you to incorporate that into your initial proposal. Just because, you know, it's it, this is not like the budget where there's a very, there's so many things that we have to fund that we carry forward from next year, or the CAP where there's already a 10-year plan and we're just making shifts or maybe adding a project here and there. This is a completely, I won't, I wouldn't say unrestricted because there are there are restrictions, but this is a completely like, we can just dream big. We could do any sorts of thing with this $6 million. And I think we shouldn't be necessarily constrained by this same type of schedule that we have for budget or CAP because it's such a different type of pool of money. Um, pools of money, I guess, because they're, they're separate. So anyway, this, this proposed, I, I don't, we could put it up on the screen if you want. I, I, I don't have access to Zoom right now, but I could um, put it up there. But just as a, as a way to spread this out, give time for the commissions to give feedback, earlier opportunity for us to learn about the rules, provided that, Misty, you have the opportunity to actually put that presentation together. Um, and then actual time for, for the mayor to be able to consider those proposals and incorporate into the initial. Because I don't necessarily want to go through, I mean, you know me, I have, I have probably 15 ideas right now that I could say off the top of my head. Uh, and I don't want to irritate you all with 100 amendments. You know, I, I think that I can provide you some information and you can make some decisions in advance of what you think could be included in the proposal, given the freedom that we have. And then that by the time the council amendments come, which I think they should, maybe it'll be a shorter conversation because some of those ideas have already been incorporated. So. I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to see if anyone has any thoughts. Yeah, I just, I guess a couple things. One, I don't know that it's fair for staff to be ready in the first two weeks of January because many of them are off, you know, at the end of the month, end of this month. I think that, you know, just based on what I've heard from commitments people made during the budget process is I'm not, I don't see many projects that we haven't heard about even being proposed, frankly, because there's way more than $6 million of stuff that are <laughs> is already on <laughs> budgets and timelines and stuff like that. So it's not like I'm going to propose an indoor skating rink or something crazy like that. I mean, someone can do that. I'm not going to <laughs> because I think there was a lot of great ideas that we didn't fund during the budget process that make sense to bring forward now. And I heard a lot of people talk about, I wanna do this during this. And so those projects is naturally, it makes sense for me to put in those in those projects as well. And yeah, I mean, it is a short timeline, but, and it's short turnaround, but I, I don't see it being all these crazy new ideas. I think it's doing a lot of stuff that we've already talked about wanting to do and haven't had the funding to do in past years. So Julia, go ahead. You know, the last, um, the last day here is March 8th. If you want to do it before election because you want to have the input from this council. So, you know, election are April 5th. And then, um, so we have another extra, a couple more weeks that where we can, maybe we can space out some of the public hearing with some of the meeting, you know, this is, you know, it's to give more opportunity to pa the public because this is the other concern. Some, sometimes people, they don't know uh, stuff because there is not too much time to promote stuff. And so this is what I say, why March 8th? Why we cannot go extend it to, what is the last council meeting from this council? April 12th. April 12th. You know I mean? I, yeah, that one's a little sketchy. I just, I think we could go to the last one in March. I worry about doing the one in April only in case for whatever reason, it gets, I don't know, people disagree or people are all ticked off about the election and oh, have vendettas about things like that. So I think we talked about that, Misty. I, I should let you speak to, to the, some of this stuff as well. Sorry. You want to comment? No? <laughs> all right. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're doing great. Oh, uh, the only right. <laughs> reason why I included the first March meeting as the action date was to give us some flexibility. So like Aaron said, if for whatever reason, we're not able to come to an agreement on what that spending plan should include. We had that backup meeting to get it done. Yeah, yeah, but I, I would worry about having something this important in that April meeting only because stuff happens during elections and sometimes people are 
unhappy and yeah. I I understand that, but um, you know, <laughs> it's like there is no you know. It's, it's too compressed, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I, I want to know if this plan, the spending plan has any flexibility. You know what I mean? It's if, if, you know, we decided to, in March A, to, this is, the, this is what we're going to approve, but something happened. You know, we get some other source of funding. Do we have, the, this is like, a, it's going to be like a revocable stuff or a revocable stuff. You know, we can change this or no. This is, you know what I mean? So that was my concern because, um, and I, I, and I want to be, uh, uh, maybe, Misty, you can send us information about ARPA because I want to understand what we can do with those ARPA funds, first of all. Um, I know that we have a list of thin wish list that we couldn't accomplish during budget, but um, I have other ideas too, you know, but I want to know if I can use ARPA funds or not, you know what I mean? Because we talk about a stormwater project, but you can use ARPA funds for many other things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, so this is the question for me is I, why we don't go at, until the last week of March so we have more, we space up some of the, the public outreach. Other questions, comments at all? Gabriel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I, I I respect that the staff doesn't necessarily want to do things, but I, I don't think we should wait till the end of January to talk about what the, what I would, the guidelines well, I wouldn't are. say it is. I don't think staff wants to do things. Oh, okay. Well, so, <laughs> I, I understand I that they want their vacation, I, and I respect that. And I, But I, 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 I want to see if maybe we could get at least guidelines, or even if it's just the whatever the official ARPA guidelines are that we're, we're operating under. I assume that it's available somewhere that the League of Wisconsin Municipalities has something. Like, I think there should be some sort of content that talks about how this money can be used yeah, for, so that we can generate the ideas. I just need to know like, um, where we can look for that and where we can advertise it. Maybe, And I don't know how long the, the presentation at Committee of the Whole, I don't know how long that was, how long that would take. Like, I, I don't know, is that, is that, a, is that an hour long presentation? Is it kind of a quick summary of the guidelines? Misty, could you give some insight into what what that that usage of the funds presentation would would look like? Yeah, go ahead, Misty. Yeah, so it's exactly what you and Julia are talking about. So what the ARPA guidelines are, you know, what best practices are, where this money is coming from, um, process stuff like that. And there are the interim final guidelines that are available on the Treasury's website, but I can send links to everybody ahead of time. That's not a problem. The concern I would have, though, is that these documents are very long, and there's a lot of nuances that are included in the documents that I think are important for me to point out to you guys, so that you're aware of some of those nuances. Um, especially, you know, stormwater projects. We talked about that during budget. It can be used on water quality, but not on water quantity. You know, things like that that aren't very clear by reading the hundred-page guidelines that are available. I mean, so that's what that committee of the whole meeting would be, would be me putting together a presentation to talk about all of that. And then my expectation would be that it would be an open discussion after that for the council to talk. And I'd say that all of you are welcome to send me ideas on things you want to put in there. That Even with the budget, I've asked for that, and people usually, I don't think, ever have. But yeah, I'm very welcome to, if you want to give me ideas anytime between now and then, either email me or call me or anything like that. I'm, more than happy to hear those. Anyone, other comments, suggestions? Seen nothing, I mean, Gabriel? I, I guess I'm just not happy with the schedule. If we're, if we're moving, if we're gonna vote on the schedule, I'm gonna vote no, because I, I just don't think that this is a good schedule. I think at the very least we should move that final meeting yeah. to the second meeting in March, and then the schedule should, should flow more logically from that point. And I appreciate, like if we're, if we're gonna wait till January 26th to have the initial conversation, I think the fact that the that your proposed budget is just like less than a week later, I mean that means that your budget's already put together. Right? Yeah. You're you're like you're not going to use the feedback from that meeting, are you? I mean, I, I guess it's a question. That's you, a big assumption that I'm not going to do anything in that well, week. Well, but I mean, like you're going to already going to have a framework for it, right? I mean, maybe like you, are you going to be able to have time to actually incorporate the information that you get in that cow meeting into your proposed budget, or is it is it because? If there's not enough time, I just don't know that I, I believe that there's there's enough time for you to actually incorporate it. I guess I think that there is, and I think at least half of it's probably already committed by the commitments people on this board have made during the budget process. There's a lot of stuff that people committed to during the budget process already. So don't 
don't interrupt. I can, I'll call on you, but don't interrupt. So I think, yeah, there is time, and it means we want to move it back. Like okay, so weeks, you think that fine, the, the but, so just to be, the, but, that conversation, you're going to incorporate some things from that conversation sure, into, the yeah, plan, into your proposal? Of course. Of course. You well, I that. mean, maybe. I, I mean, I, obviously, it's at your discretion. Gonna, right. It's at your discretion, but I there's can. no reason to think that you couldn't take Correct. an idea that was presented there and actually incorporate it in your proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Julie. Yep. So what we don't discuss, we have two, um, we have a council meeting when it's January 15, no. January 11. 11. So maybe we can start the discussion in that meeting, you know, so we can, you know, we start thinking about this. Um, and then um, maybe there is a list, you say, Mayor, that there is a list already that we discuss if we can, is that list, I imagine that list is ready. So can you share the list with us so we can see the, so it's the same thing that we forgot to, we did, you know, some of the stuff that we didn't approve during budget time. So we can take a look at the list, you know what I mean? Um, and then, um, so, so we can start the process a little bit early. We already have an idea what are the things in that list. So to, to have an idea, this is everything that I brought to the budget, didn't, wasn't approved, so it's there. So I start working in this process, you know, um, because I, I want to say I, I, I don't feel comfortable with this, uh, with the frame, for because I want the public to have, to get, to give the public more time to also to participate. And this, you look at the, you know, it's one week, one week, one week, and then how we're going to do the outreach to the public. How we're going to put it in the Fitch for a Star. When is the Fitch for a Star going out? It's going the, the, the February 10, usually it's out. So we are going to have the public hearing on Tuesday, February 8th. So the Fitch for a Star, the printed version is out uh, the, fo the following weekend, you know. So this is another thing that we need to think about how to outreach the public too. Well, I, I am not, I'm not comfortable with the way the schedule is laid out either. Um, but I think, I think that we have some options here. First, the first option is, um, we are not required to have our committee of the whole meeting on the fourth Wednesday of the month. It just says that the, uh, our ordinance just says the committee of the whole meetings will be called as necessary by the council president. Um, so in, in January, we have a council meeting on January 11th, and I don't know that there's any reason why we couldn't have that first meeting where, where Misty lays out all this information to us on the 12th, on Wednesday the 12th. Is there, Misty? I don't know if you have enough time to prepare by then. Uh, the 11th is better than the 4th. Uh, the other thing I don't know is what other meetings might conflict. Well, the, I was talking about the 12th, which is the Wednesday. So if we moved that committee of the whole meeting to the 12th, that would, that would provide um, some time for the council to understand what's exactly allowed and not allowed prior to any of the rest of this happening. Now, you're proposing coming out with a mayor's proposed thing on the, the 31st, which is, I mean, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I don't think this needs to take six months to do, but I also think this is a big deal. I mean, we don't, ha we don't have opportunities like this ever. <laughs> so we need to get it right. And we, so we need to take, even though, even if we do it in this, two and a half month time frame, we need to make sure that we're putting in enough time to get it done right. So I guess, um, I guess what I would say, well, I, I would say as a first point, why don't we move that uh, committee, why don't we move that first meeting from January 26th to January 12th? What do you think about that, Randy? I know there's another speaker on the, me the whole in January. I don't know if they we do have another speaker committed for the 26th. Maybe they can do it earlier. We're not 
Yeah. I mean, well, I you know, speak. there's also nothing in the ordinance that prevents us from meeting both of those nights. And we may just need one night. We may, I mean, this is probably going to take more than an hour. I'm just going out on a limb with that. <laughs> I guess my biggest concern, I guess, Misty, is that enough time for you to get everything together that you need to because there's holidays and vacations and stuff like that between now and the 12th. What about the 12th? So. so vacations I'm not concerned about. Obviously, I'll be here. We have property tax collection happening now. Um, the 12th, I think, is doable. Uh, the other big thing I'd like to point out is the rules do change. Um, so Julia's question about whether this was final, uh, this isn't. You know, this is kind of the first lane of what those priorities are. Uh, there's not just the infrastructure bill that you referenced, but there's also a flexibility act being discussed right now, um, which would open up even more opportunities for how we can spend the money. Um, so this is really just that first step laying out those priorities. And it's not going to be a 200 page document like what the budget is. You know, it's just going to be a a listing of what those priorities are with the years that we're kind of thinking as a sketch out. Um, so it's not going to be as thorough of a document um, as what you have seen for both CIP and budget either. So Misty, based on that, it sounds like, you know, whatever we come up with at the end of March is still not in stone. That's more of a, maybe in wood, you know, something where it's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it can be changed as we find out more information, but it is more of a, guideline, I suppose, than nothing, or here's just a bunch of random projects. It's kind of a, a, I don't know, an outline, I guess, if you will. Is that accurate? Exactly. Okay. I like to think of it as council setting out what the priorities are, and then we would have to dive into the details, you know, make sure we know what all the requirements are and that it's eligible. And, you know, there's, once you hit a certain project, there's different procurement rules that apply. And so there's a lot of details that need to be figured out. We don't want to figure that out for all of the projects. We want to figure it out just for the ones that are priorities for the council. So it's that first framework. And that's been the most frustrating thing about ARP all along is that it's like they gave us a bunch of money and then said, well, we'll, we'll tell you at some point how to spend it. And it, it changes seemingly pretty often. <laughs> well, let's, let's explore that a little bit because that's, that's an important point. So when when would this money actually be available to us to spend? So we received half of it already and we'll get the other half in 2022. So, so, we, so have we, a, could... we have a chunk of it sitting in an account somewhere and we, so yeah. we don't have to ask for it. We don't have to fill out an application for it. It's just here. We just have already... to, we just have to expend it according to the guidelines. Correct. So I've already requested the funding. So we have to determine how we're going to spend it, make sure we're in compliance, and then file reporting. And the first set of reports is due April 30th. And then it's every April 30th after that. And we have to spend it by a certain day, right? Yeah. Yep. So it has to be obligated by the end of 2024, which basically means contract signed. And then we have to actually spend it, checks out the door by the end of 2026. I don't think we'll have a problem with either one of those. Probably not. Gabriela. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I appreciate Jay's suggestion of the possibility of moving to January 12th. I think that would go a long way towards helping what I've, what my concerns were. The other big concern I have is the timeline for the amendments. Like Julia pointed out that right now it says there's a public hearing on Tuesday and then amendments are due three days later. That like, what if there's a great idea that comes out of that meeting that would be like a perfect candidate for an amendment? I can't commit to having the time to be able to put something together like that within a few days. So I'd prefer it at least to be moved to the 14th of February, which is the next Monday. So at least I have like a weekend to work on it. Um, and then obviously the summary report and amendment details posted to the city's website would have to be pushed as well. So I guess if I, uh, my proposal to amend this in the most simple way would be to move committee of the whole um, from January 26th to January 12th, and then move the council proposed amendments due to finance director to February 14th, and then correspondingly move that, that summary report um, a few days later based on whatever 
is possible for city staff, which it sounds like it's like three business days, two or three business days after um, they're submitted. Oh, but you as a weekend, you do a weekend, Misty. That's why you put it on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The I don't know, other, I, sorry, if I may. The, the other nuance is generally we want these in the packet. So in order to be available in the packet for the Wednesday committee whole, the latest would be that Friday before. And I'm supposed to have it done by Thursday at noon. That would be that would be the committee of the whole we're talking about on the twenty third, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Julia, do you have a question? Yes, my, my, my other concern is uh, probably hearing that we are moving the March eighth because so to promote that public hearing, if we move it like a couple of days after March eighth, when the, the you know the feature star is already the printed edition is hitting the mailboxes is going to be the Friday and Saturday after March 8. So people have a night. People, people read the the feature star the printed version so it's going to be a good option for them to to do the outreach to um, I don't know. And then move to have a discussion and adoption in the last meeting of March. I don't know which days. I will feel more comfortable doing like that. Do you have that, March? Yeah, Misty, I don't know You know, if we went to the last meeting in March and we moved up to Committee of the Whole. I don't know if it makes sense. If you want to suggest a few changes, other changes to a couple spots, I mean, Trying to get people here in the council to scratch it out. <laughs> There's a lot of things, obviously, that you you think about and we don't necessarily know about. So I don't know if you have suggestions for changes or adjustments. So moving it to the second meeting in March is obviously not a concern as long as council feels that they can get it done in one one meeting and not have to delay it to a future meeting. Um. I am concerned about the turning around the council amendments too, so I can appreciate that council wants more time also. Uh, we could also, I could do just a compilation of the PDFs and not spend any time, you know, working through the details of it, like what I would a council amendment. Um, so if you wanted that part of it taken out of the process, we could pull that out. That would make that turnaround much faster. Um, as long as everyone recognizes, I guess, what the limitations are of that streamlined process. Let, let me, I'm, I want to make an amendment to what, to what this is. Yes, we got to, we got to do something. We can't just sit here all night and talk about this. All right. So the, the first amendment I want to make is to change the date of the initial kickoff to January 12th and to change the date of the mayor's proposal from January 31st to January 24th, move it a week earlier. So that will be my first amendment to try to get this thing moving. And so it sounds like there's a motion. Is there a second? Wait, I'm sorry. What, what the, what's the date for the move the mayor's proposed from January 31st to what date? To January 24th, one week, week earlier. earlier. I still don't have a second. All right, Dave's second. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if you want to speak to any further, Jay, I think we talked. I, I, I think that that gives more time between. I, I think that starts to address Julia's concern about not giving the public enough time to see what's going on. Um, I think it it just puts a little more space between these things, um, and it. Uh, and I, it gets this process started a little bit quicker. I mean, I, I, I totally get your concern about not wanting to go to the last, to the first meeting in April. I totally get it. It makes sense to me. Um, but I, we can address that further down. I just want to get something moving here so that there's more of a comfort level. So I think getting some more space at the beginning uh, helps with that. 
Misty, I just want to check to see if there's any initial concerns you have since you're doing a lot of work about her on this. Yeah, so the the 12th, I did look it up. There's also a personnel committee meeting that day. So I assume if we have the special committee of the whole meeting at six, that probably wouldn't um, coordinate it. But we'd also want to make sure FACT TV is available because I assume this is a topic that we want to make sure is able to be taped and shared with the public as well. So I guess there's some logistics that we'd want to double check and make sure staff is all available to, to meet the needs. And then as far as the mayor's proposal on the 24th, uh, back to this isn't going to be an exceptionally thorough document. It's going to be basically a spreadsheet with the projects and the years. Um, I think the 24th is doable as long as Aaron's very succinct and uh, makes decisions quickly. That probably would be an option. So it's all my fault. I see how it is. All right. <laughs> Could I make a friendly right. amendment? Well, we're giving you more than five <laughs> days from the committee of the whole meeting. I mean, now you've got like 10 days, 12 Could I days. Make a suggestion to add to your amendment, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So sure. Change, change the February 11th proposed amendments due date to February 14th so that there's a weekend. Change that February 18th date whatever it works for staff to make that work. So I don't know if that's, a, that's four days later, whatever that is. And then change the Mar March 8th final meeting to March 22nd. So that's second meeting in, in March instead of the first meeting in March. Well, I think he wanted to just piece it all a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, oh, okay. I just no, think doing, one, doing one at a time here. Yeah. We, I, I totally support those ideas, but let's just get something to happen here. Because I don't want to be the resident night talking about this stupid yeah. schedule. All right, so any other uh, comments on moving the community whole up a couple weeks and then I believe it's my so, um, my suggestion or my uh, budget a week earlier in that piece at all? Seeing none, all in favor of those amendments say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right, so those amendments are Approved, at least tentatively approved. And it also gives finance committee more than three days to look it over before that special meeting. Yeah. All right, and then it sounds like we've, for sure anyway, want to move the end date back two weeks if someone wants to move that. I'll make a motion to move the final date from March 8th to March 22nd. Second. All right, signed by Jay. Any further discussion on that? We talked about it quite a bit, so I don't think there is, but seeing none. Can I ask yeah, a clarifying question? Yes. So uh, is that the public hearing as well, or just the actual adoption? The what public hearing and the, oh, that's a Oh, we have two though. public, yeah, there's two public hearings. Because we could do the public hearing separate from the <laughs> votes. You can. Budget, we always do it the same night. I don't know if it matters. We can do it the same, I, I, we can keep them together. Keep them together? Okay. Yeah. All right. Then uh, all in favor of moving, I guess, the public hearing and the at least hopefully final decision back two weeks, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right. All right. So and then we're just working out the stuff in the middle. I think we were okay with up to the public hearing on February 8th, right? Maybe. <laughs> okay. So, so then, but the, but um, understandably, there's some more time wanted for um, council to submit amendments. So, I mean, we got a whole month to work with here. So um, that, that February 14th is probably fine for that. Well, that's not a meeting date. That's just the deadline to get your amendments to Misty. Mm -hmm. So Monday, February 14th instead of February 11th? Yes, and then also change that summary date, whatever, whatever works for staff. So flexible based on... So do you want to... Well, I think we have to have that on the 16th to have it to on the agenda or in the packet for committee the whole. So I mean there might be a day, frankly. There's probably another day in there. Do we have Thursday. to have it in the packet? Can, can I ask a it's, question? If you, uh, hold well. on. <laughs> so I answer the question first. So it, it's preferable to have it in the packet because again, 
public input, yeah, public can yeah, see yeah, it, yeah. public can read through it. So but it will be publicly that. available, though, right? Like it's it'll be on the website, website whenever it's ready. Yeah. But, yeah. Could, could I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so, Misty, uh, so this amendment that we need to submit to you, they are not going to be like the budget where you know we have to put a reason in. And, you know, I, I imagine reason, but the numbers, you know, it's going to be more a simple form, isn't it, for you even to fill up, isn't it? Because you don't need to yeah. look for funds and from where the money is coming. So right, so we'll still need. It'll be kind of more like a CIP amendment. So okay. we'll need your proposed timing, your okay. proposed dollar okay. amount, and then why this is or is not a priority, and why you want to change it. Okay. I will appreciate you know to have February 14 for several reasons. All right. Did we have a motion for February 14th? I don't 14th? think we do. All right, I'll make a motion that we move the council deadline to February 14th. All right. Signed by Julia. So proposed amendments would be Monday, so you'd have the weekend to work through that. Any further comments, questions? And February 14th and February 16th gives you enough time, Misty, to compile all that? the 700 amendments you're going to get. <laughs> yeah, so it'll go to expectations. So if the expectation okay. is really just that I'm compiling a PDF, that's not a problem at all. Uh, if you want me to verify that the project is eligible and what the different procurement rules are and that stuff, that won't be enough time. Um, but I'll have some time before we actually vote on it to try to figure that out. Awesome. And again, this is just a plan. So worst, come, worst case scenario is you approve something that's not actually eligible, uh, we would come back and change it. And much like with the budget and CIP, if you have an amendment, the sooner you can ask Misty about it, the better. She will give you lots of great information and advice. So also be nice to her and don't just say, oh, here you go. Here's a bunch of stuff. Surprise on Monday. <laughs> the earlier you can let her know what you're working on, she, can, she will make it better for you. Do that, please. <laughs> I will. I promise, Misty, I will not give you 100 amendments on that Monday. I will get them to you sooner than that. Maybe just one extra one after the public hearing. That's that's all I'm looking for. Less than 100. I, I marked that down here. No, she didn't say 100. No, no, no. She didn't say she went to 100. She went to 100 last second. <laughs> all right. So uh, the amendments proposed is for council amendments due on Monday, February 14th. Seeing no other discussion on that, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed nay. All right. Are we good with? All right. Meeting? So then where we're at is we've got the committee of the whole meeting on the 23rd, mm -hmm. where uh, Misty's going to tell us maybe what we can do and what we can't do, or maybe you won't have all that information available yet. Probably not. I think it's going to be kind of like the uh, amendments probably for the budget where, you know, we have the list of two or three and, and then we can discuss those or, or but, 20. But or sometime whatever. before the 22nd, you'll know. March 22nd. <laughs> mm, no, even that <laughs> could change. <laughs> <laughs> not to put all this pressure on you or anything. I mean, that's just it. It's still going to be somewhat flexible, even regardless of what we approve. So. Yeah. All right. Sorry. So, I don't. I, you want Gabriel to go? Well, she, All right. yeah, I'm, All right. I'm done. Go, go ahead, Gabriel. I don't know if this is part of the amendment, but I'm. I would like to. Could we direct the staff that uh, is in charge of the different committees to add it to the committee agendas if they can for that month, so that the committees have the schedule, they know when things are going to be posted, so if they have ideas. I mean, this, those are some of our most engaged citizens. I think we should we should bring them in and make it a discussion items for those those committee meetings in that January, February time period. Yeah, and I think anything that they've either had removed from recent budgets or have upcoming in the next couple budgets that might make sense to accelerate are good starting points anyway for those committees who are meeting for a discussion item. But yeah, I mean, that's something that Chad can direct staff to. All right, so I don't hear any other changes to the timeline then. Maybe. So I think we can proceed with approving as amended, but I do want to check in with Misty first. Go ahead, Misty. 
Just one last one. So uh, we did also move the summary report from me from the 16th to the 17th, correct? We didn't do so that. We didn't do day, that yet, so but we can. I think that would be good. So All nobody's right. already right. looking for it on the 16th. I'll move to change the summary report to the 17th. Second that motion. Something about Dave. I don't think we need to discuss more. Uh, in favor of changing the summary dates, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right, and that is also adjusted. Now, anything else you're concerned about, Misty? Or, well, maybe, but you're not going to say right now. <laughs> Nothing that we can fix on a schedule, correct. Chad, go ahead. In regards to the referrals to those committees, uh, I just want to confirm that the council would find it acceptable that the referral would go out after the, the um, January 12th presentation because I think that that would be important to have that context for those committees as we've talked about earlier. So I just want to confirm that that, that is the expectation that you have for staff is that from the committees after January 12th, we get it on the referral schedule. And then what is the end time? What what date would you like as the end for those referral for those well, commissioner well, committee before, meetings? If I'm making myself clear, I would say probably before council amendments are due because after council, I mean after the council amendment deadline passes, it doesn't matter what they think at that point. So February fourteenth. I would. Okay. I would say. Okay. I mean. It's, well, I was going to say there's nothing that's yeah. really happening in the 14th, 13th, 12th, yeah. or 11th. So. Roughly 11th. Yep. All right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. So I don't see any other adjustments to the timeline. And so I think we can go to approving as amended. So all in favor of approving the timeline as amended, say aye. 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 And oppose nay. All right. That is approved. Next up, would someone like to make a motion for this item five? I'll move approval of resolution R 23221, allowing members of the Common Council and other bodies to appear telephonically or via the internet until March 31st, 2022. Second. Senator Randy. And this is again, this is really for council members. We're going to still continue the Zoom option for the public for sure, regardless. I think that's probably a in perpetuity type of thing, uh, but did want to uh, allow council members to appear electronically, possibly. And maybe, you know, I know, I think Madison was talking about, or the county board was talking about stopping it soon. It's really up to us. We want to extend it for another quarter and see where we're at but I want to put this on here to at least provide that option to extend it again. Comments, questions, people agree? That's fine. That's fine. Great, all right. All right, then let's vote. All in favor of ex extending this to March 31st, say aye. 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 And opposed, nay. All right, so that is approved. And then item six, I don't know that we will have to do any action or want to do any action, but I know there's a couple of things in particular people asked about, and maybe we should have talked about guidelines and expectations a while ago after we had done this a while and learned more. Two things that recently I've heard people ask me about is, and we don't even necessarily have to formally take action as much as just agree amongst ourselves that, hey, we should be doing this. But two things were if you're online that the majority of the time your camera is on. I've heard that comment from people that, if you're online, you know, if you have to go to the bathroom, if you want to, if you're eating a snack and you want people seeing you, you know, shove food in your mouth, that's fine. But majority of the time, I think, you know, I've heard people want that expectation that your camera is online. And then the other thing that I also heard from a couple people again is around closed sessions and concern with people being in the room with people that are home during a closed session. And whether that's if you're home during a closed session, you have headphones on, or I mean, we could say you can't be part of it, but I know the last meeting, there was a concern during our closed session that one of the people online was talking to someone, and it might have been a kid, I don't, I don't know who it was, kid, spouse, whoever it was, but and that was a concern that was raised is, again, you know, I don't know who's in the room, and Maybe it's either you're in a room with no one else or you have headphones so that no one else can hear. I don't know, but that was just, those are two things I know about. And maybe there's other things that people are concerned about. 
and again, we don't necessarily have to do a formal motion as much as, hey, here's some, as we've learned more about this and done this for a year and a half now, here's a couple things that we would like people to do if they're gonna be online for council members, specifically staff. I don't expect to have the camera on all the time or anything like that. This is really for council members. So that's it all. I see this, uh, I, I have one of the concerns. I don't know, I talked to you about one of those, uh, but I, I think as a elected official that we are preceding a, a meeting, we should be on, on camera, you know what I mean? Um, you know, I think that, yes. And then the, the closed session, yeah, it's important that we, no one in the room should be listening to a closed session that, you know, I agree with that. So they are good comments. Okay. It's something that we can, or maybe Chad can send out with, hey, here's some, some guidelines. Yeah. I mean, that, that's two, I don't know if there's other ones, but other, I want to make sure other people get a chance to speak, Jim. Chad, I don't know if you would want to ask Valerie, uh, what kind of liabilities would we be exposed to by having a supposed closed session and people are, you know, not in the room? Um, I, I don't know. I can kind of imagine some things that can come up, you know, depending on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Affidavit saying that no one is going to be in the room. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, to protect, you know what I mean? To I guess more of the question is, if someone does have someone in the room and they're not at least using a headphones or something like that, what as a council do we do about that? You know, is it, the, oh, I'm sorry, and then nothing happens? Or as a council, are we saying, if you violate something like this guideline, are we removing from a committee? Are we prevent, saying you can't be online anymore? Or you can't be in a closed session online anymore? I don't know what that is, but as a council, that's really, I guess kind of up for us to say is you had people in the room, other people saw it, mm -hmm. and so is there a ramification? Is there a consequence or not? Yeah, I mean, if there's no consequence, then <laughs> I don't say it doesn't matter, but you know, who's to say that they're gonna stop doing it? Dave? Don't you think it's just easiest if it's closed session, you're online, that you you're, you're booted off during that? I think that's the, that's the simplest and cleanest. That's an option. And I, you know, I. Oh, you don't participate in those interviews. You know, you, you know. That's a possibility. It's, that's a that's a limitation if you can't you know, oh, can't yeah. be here, and I think that gets us clear. Yes. I, I would uh, be able to definitively answer Valerie's question based on Dave's suggestion, and that that would most significantly reduce any potential liability. That's for sure. Yeah. And that's possible, Scott. To... Oh yeah. Okay. You can turn him off like anyone else, Gabriel. Person wants to really to participate in a closed session, they should come. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's possible, Gabriel. I, I do like having the ability to be virtual because, I, especially in a pandemic, is ongoing. However, there are ways that we can protect ourselves now in the pandemic. So, um, I don't. I think it's reasonable to say that if you if you're going to be part of the closed session, you have to be here in person. And at this point in the pandemic, I think that's a reasonable expectation. Um, I do think it's worth considering if we can have people participate virtually in the future in other ways, but I think closed sessions is like a really good line to draw. Okay. So yeah, so I guess what I'm hearing is that one, you should have your camera on at least most of the time if you're online, and two, it sounds like if we're doing a closed session, then if you're online, you can't participate. We're gonna essentially shut off the, the cameras and the mics and, and not you know, won't be able to participate. Is there anything else? And those are two that I've heard. I don't know if there's any other concerns people have, but those are the two things I heard anyway. Well, as, as somebody who lives alone, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, and I, I've had to attend a couple of meetings remotely, one when I just simply wasn't in town. Um, and I think there was one I attended while I was driving down the highway and I didn't necessarily want a camera bouncing around in my car. Um, but uh, I, I, I do, the, there is a sensitive nature of, of the closed sessions and the ones we've had recently have really just been, if that information got out, it would, it wouldn't really, it would damage us. It wouldn't really, there wouldn't really be any liability except to us. <laughs> so, um, but that's, but that's important too. 
Um, so I, so I, I, I think I agree with that sentiment that, it, that maybe that should be a guideline, that if you're gonna attend a meeting remotely, that's fine, but if there's a closed session, then you're gonna have to be here. And maybe for the, like being in the car driving, I, I agree that it can be kind of disorienting for people, but maybe it's saying, hey, I'm here, I'm in the car, which is why I have my camera off. If it's gonna be for a long period of time with just kind of letting the public know why. Because there are some legitimate reasons like that where you you do want to take your camera off. It, it's not great to watch. The no camera. one wants to watch me driving down <laughs> the interstate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I well, think, uh, yeah, Julia. The other right? scene is um, no eating. I'll turn the camera off while you're eating. <laughs> while you're having beer. <laughs> or no beer. So, yeah, so I guess, yeah, that's... <laughs> And going to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> it's look like, no, it's look back when you're. All right. So I think we've got at least a couple of uh, expectations, I guess. And good. Yeah. Chad will summarize that, send that out. All right. Then next meeting is in January for both council and committee of the whole. The committee of the whole looks like it might be January 12th instead. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Jay, seconded by Dave. All in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed nay. We are adjourned.